Uh, greetings, Brother Judah from the Congregation of Israel, a representative of the NMP, the Nazarene Messianic Party. And I'd like to greet everyone who have taken their time out to view our uh, broadcast and to join in tonight's discussion. And uh, today I want to deal with a topic dealing with Israel, the Israelites. That's, you know, uh, I want to point them out a bit because of the job that they have. And that is uh, Israelites. And when they fulfill their job, they will become enemies of the state. Now, in becoming enemies of the state, I said if they fulfill their job, what kind of job? To fulfill their job as revolutionaries. And uh, I want to continue. If you didn't catch last week, this is a continuation of a document that we've been reading through called the Revolutionary Catechism. Shabbat Shalom, Brother Job. Shabbat Shalom, Sister Shebru. Shabbat Shalom to you. Thank you for taking your time out to join in. And uh, I know that some people had got their hands on this revolutionary catechism and I posted it up there so people can get their hands on it. And I know if you got the whole or the entire document, you may be wondering, Brother Judah, what in the world are you talking about? I mean, we read through this document. And this is just, come on, brother. All right. So what we need to do is establish this by the text. And we're going to do that. Now, as I said before, the goals are the same. There's a more perfect method out the text, but we're going to prove the goals are the same. God willing, we approve that. Now, uh, this revolutionary catechism, it will make the Israelite the enemy of the state. And I mean truly, not you are on the FBI most wanted list because you're riotous, you know, or you're like the uh, zealots or you're like the um, fifth philosophy and all of these zealots during the um, uh, first century that ultimately led to the invasion of Rome and the destruction of Jerusalem. See, it's, an impo it's important to not get caught in um, romanticizing the Bible, meaning not getting caught up into the impractical analysis of it. Shalom, the daughter of the Most High. Shalom to you, daughter. Shalom to you. And uh, thank you for taking your time out to join us tonight. Yeah, you know, it's important not to get caught up in that. Um, because you may miss out on the uh, real history of it. Now, the zealots led the children of Israel into a great slaughter. That's what happened. And they considered themselves revolutionaries as well. But we follow Yeshua of Nazareth or Yeshua ben Joseph. That's, that's what they had known him by in that day. And he had a different message. And I want to go through the revolutionary catechism because I feel that I want or I feel that is necessary for the people to look at the Bible from a different angle. If you don't choose to look at the Bible from that angle, go back to the other way you've been looking at it. OK, but at least presenting an alternative view of what we're dealing with. Now, we went to establish a few things last week. And that was that the revolutionary was a doomed man. And we established that by the scriptures. We established that by the apostle Paul. We established that by the master teacher himself, Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. We established it um, in various passages. He's a doomed man. All right. And we found this out. And this is exactly what the Bible supported. You shall be hated of, of all. You shall be 
uh, brought before kings and governors. You shall be killed. Paul said, for we are killed all the day long for the sake of the revolution. See, the problem that I will argue is this, is that the people don't understand the kingdom of God to be revolutionary. When they picture the kingdom of God, oftentimes is abstract. And the way to get in there is uh, you, you have various answers from different people. Um, but ultimately, it's just pretty much you just wait until something happens. The um, accountability and the human participation um, that is needed uh, seems to be lacking among people who claim to believe the Bible. So in that particular case, if you hold the Bible, you're probably not a doomed person. You'll probably fit right in like the Sadducee and the Pharisee. Shalom, shalom, F shalom. You'll probably fit right in. You know, you know, you, you, you that's see the Sadducees, they fit right into the empire. You understand what I'm saying? So when you start to look at the Bible in depth, what is the call of Abraham? I wanted everybody to know those who follow the class. The call of Abraham is to raise up children to bring justice and judgment in the earth. Okay. So when you are going against the established powers, when you're going against the powers that um, oppress and crush the people of the world, then you do become a doomed person. And he also adds that this revolutionary, he has no attachments and nothing like that to the social order. We establish that. That's how the scriptures teaches it, teach us. Now, we dealt with... Um, the revolutionary, he knows that in his very depths of his being, not only in word, but indeed he must perform the works of this revolution. We establish that about out of the uh, apostles and that uh, even the Messiah himself. So we went through various scriptures, you know, be not conformed to this world. That's what Paul was arguing. And, you know, when you search in the depths, of your inward heart, you start to realize that it's going to take more than just speech. It's going to take me doing something. That's when you really start, when the word began to take root, right? And so we leading down into the next number three. Number three, we're going into number three, the third one. And that is the revolutionary despises all doctrines. If you don't if the word revolutionary makes you uncomfortable, you can go back to our class we did last week. In the beginning, we read the definition of revolutionary. But you know what? We're going to do something even better just so people won't have to they, they, just in case um, we'll make it convenient. Now, revolutionary revolution is this, right? According to the Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, a revolution is a sudden radical or complete change all right a fundamental change in political organization so when you're talking about removing the political powers that oppress and crush the people of the world and bringing in a new political organization which the bible terms the kingdom of god or the reign of elohim then we're talking about a complete change because the reign of elohim describes or the reign of god says that his kingdom shall fill the whole earth. We're talking about a complete overthrow, a thorough, complete overthrow of all powers. And any power, according to the prophets, any power that do not yield to this new will be crushed. All right. It will perish. Okay. Shalom. Shalom. Uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, uh, Zamila. Zamila. Shalom to you. Glad to see you able to come out with us again. All right. Now, we're talking about a fundamental change in the political organization, the overthrow or renunciation of one government. We're talking about removing the the governments of the nations and bringing in the government of the kingdom of God. So um, the uh, revolution is the renunciation of one government or ruler or the substitution of another by the governed. Okay. 
activity or movement designed to affect fundamental changes in the social economic situation. Kingdom of God, we prove that the kingdom of God is doing just that. It will redistribute the wealth of the world. You will find this in all through the Bible. The rich shall be crushed and the, the all of the uh, spoils of the rich nations shall be converted over to the nation of Israel. And there the nation of Israel will uh, uh, assume their duties. That is distributing the, uh, the, the resources and the goods of the earth to every man as he have need. And this pattern is found from the students of Jesus of Nazareth or Yeshua of Nazareth in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. If you analyze critically what those men were doing, you will realize that the people were bringing all their wealth to them. And they were also known as the judges in Israel. That's what Mashiach said. You shall be the judges of Israel, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, You shall be judges among the nation. Well, seeing their lot, when all of the wealth of the people came to them, it wasn't for them to use it for their own satisfaction and their own lust and, and to fill their own bellies. No, just as it will not be for the nation of Israel to consume it and be like the oppressors whom God crushed. No, Israel's job has always been to take the wealth of the earth that God had made and to make sure that mankind have all he need to survive on this planet. This is the reason why the nation of Israel and the children of Israel shall be a blessing or the sons and daughters of Abraham and Abraham himself shall be a blessing to the nations because they're going to do right with the world's goods. OK, so we're talking about a social economic change. OK, a social a change in the social economy. Capitalism will be crushed. Colonialism will, will be crushed all forms of oppression, hierarchy, a classless society shall be established in the earth. All right. All right. Do your best. Do what you can do. All right. And then uh, hopefully um, everything will go along with the recording that if any anything you may miss, um, we will have it recorded. Um, but I hope everything um, works out. So you can um, um, hear it hear it real time. But do if you have any questions or anything you miss, if you can type it in, we'll try to adjust it to compensate for whatever difficulties you may have and whatever you may miss um, trying to deal with that. Okay. Um, so we're talking revolution, and therefore, if we're talking revolution. We're talking about revolutionaries. Okay. And believe me, don't let the document, uh, many of you probably who, who do have the document, you probably could read through the document and um, you will start to hook it up yourself. You understand? But there are some things in there where, you know, um, we want to show that, yes, the Bible supports it. Uh, the goal of it, the methods can be tweaked to a more perfect way. Now, but we'll get down that to uh, in a later um, discussions of it. But remember, in section three, it says the revolutionary despises all doctrines and refuses to accept the mundane sciences or knowledges, leaving them for future generations. Now, again, before I go further, for those who just hearing this, we're reading the revolutionary catechism. It was written by Sergei Nekayev and uh, well, it was written possibly in 1881. OK, Sergei Nekayev uh, Gennadievich is his middle name, Gennadievich, but we address him as Sergei or Nekayev. He died in prison at the age of 35 um, in Russia, OK, and um, in 1882. So this obviously this document was before that. So it was roughly, I believe, if I recall my research of it, 1881. But this is the document we're looking at. Why? Because this is the different angle that we want to approach the Bible to see that this document here that had Sergi arrested and became the Tsar's special prisoner or the aristocrat's special prisoner. They logged him. They want to know everything he was doing because he had these views and these views are dangerous. 
And I'm showing you or, or want to attempt to show you that these are the exact same views in the Hebrew Bible. But the problem is, is that these views are not taught. They're somewhat overlooked as many people romanticize the uh, Bible and the kingdom of God. And what I mean by that, they sort of just look at the stories of the Bible and how it is all to play out and how you uh, 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 the, the God of heaven is using his servants. Um, they don't really have a practical application of it. You know, it's really this thing where spaceships coming or, you know, a person going to be on a cloud or they'll be raptured off. If that happened, if you disappear, you disappear. But just in case you don't disappear, this is just something else to look at it. All right. Something else. All right. So there is a job and, and, and it's important to take this into consideration because when a Messiah makes his appearance, meaning when the divine interruption reach its peak, where now it's going to intervene in human affairs on a large scale, you don't want to be found in the wrong place. And Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25 explains that blessed is the servant that when his master comes, he finds so doing. Now, I'm not dealing with that teaching tonight, but he said, blessed is the one when I come, I see them doing. So it's going to be something that must be done. Thessalonians says that the creator or, uh, or, or, or the Messiah will be he shall come in the glory of his power and he shall be glorified in his saints. Now you got to meditate on that. If he shall come in the glory of his power, but in, this, but in the next verse of the passage, it says he shall be glorified in his saints. It's implying human participation. It's implying human participation. So the revolutionary despises all doctrines and refuses to accept the mundane sciences, leaving them for future generations. In other words, the doctrines of the present day social order, the revolutionary despises it. He do not want them to be passed down to future generations. That's not his thing. He want the uh, doctrines and the sciences of the present social order to be crushed. Now, wait a minute. Could people say, boy, I mean, that's a little too much, isn't it? No, it's not actually. I was intending to go into Second Peter, the third chapter, when Peter talks about the elements being melted and on fire. If you look up elements, see, I'm not going to do that tonight because I want to do that on a different teaching on its own. But if you look it up, Peter is not talking about the elements of the earth and wind or the gases that creates wind or water. If you look up elements, he's talking about the foundational principles. OK, these are the weak and beggarly elements. Paul argued in a book of Galatians that the people are going back to. So when Peter talking about elements, he's actually talking about doctrines and sciences that shall be destroyed. You've got to destroy the doctrines and sciences because, number one, the doctrine and sciences are the foundations of the social order and the conduct of those in the social order. Meaning this, there's doctrines and sciences in this world that causes men to be oppressed by other men. There's doctrines and sciences in this world that's destroying the earth and people, you know, doing it according to the doctrines and sciences of the present day social order. It's doctrines and sciences that allows men, a, a small minority of men to consume and control all the resources of the earth. All of this is being established on the doctrine and sciences of the present day social order. And these doctrines and sciences are, are um, fed to our children in school. So they are educated to fit in that social order. Meaning if you're poor, you're bound to remain that way. 
But according to the rich argument, if a few poor people get out of that, leave them alone. I'm telling you, this is in the rich men's document. In fact, you can find it in the doctrines or the writings of Adam Smith. One of the famous economists here in America in the 1700s. So the social order or the schools, the educational apparatuses who bring forth these doctrines and sciences, they recreate the social system. Okay. It's because of this that brother is one is at one another neck because they're fighting for bread and competing for bread. Okay. But we want to destroy those doctrines where a, a few people own the means of production. We want that destroyed. Good evening. Good evening. Shalom, family. Shalom, Sister Pat. Shalom to you. So it is these doctrines and sciences that must be destroyed. All right. Now, notice what it says in the document. He knows, speaking of the revolutionary, he knows only one science. The science of destruction. And what science is he, is he speaking of? The destruction of what? The doctrines and the sciences and the social order that bring forth these monstrosities. He only know one thing. It got to go. It got to be destroyed. There's no compromising with it. There isn't any conforming it. There's no tweaking it that it'll work. You know how people say, well, you know, let's tweak the social order that it'll work. You know, we could pay off some school debt. You know, they if they get rid of our college loan debts, you know, that, that won't work. See, if you notice carefully and all of the politicians and all their arguments and how they want to help poor people and bring justice to poor people and the working people in America, you know what never comes into question? The property of the bosses. See, they, they only argue about giving you a little bit more money, clearing your debt paying off your debt, you know, give me a little bit more. No, you, you, you're deceived. The, the, they're deceiving the people again. What never comes into question is the redistribution of the earth resources. What never comes into question is that all of the rich men who own all of the land and the factories, that they relinquish it, that they let it go and it becomes the people, that the land become nationalized, that their means to produce is never called into question. Only thing that's ever called into question is how much they're going to give you, how many crumbs they want to throw off their damn table. I'm saying that the Bible says that their table will be repossessed. All of the things that they have seized upon shall be taken from them. It doesn't come into question about the thievery and the blood in which all of their wealth and factories and mines and all of the means and, and of production that they possess and all of the land and timber, it never comes into question that all of that was acquired off of the blood, sweat, and tears of the exploited masses. And the people who are the beneficiaries directly or indirectly are never called into question, but the Bible calls them into question. See, the rich man who had all of the wealth, the Bible called him into question because he was an indirect beneficiary of exploitation. So when Jesus said, or Yeshua said, take your wealth and give it to the poor and come follow me. See, the doctors and sciences that he learned from his social order, it that he didn't think that was the right thing to do, okay? So we got to destroy these doctrines and sciences. And only thing we know is destruction. Now, let me show you something here. So people say, well, brother, you know, I hear what you're saying, but the Bible speaks of love. It do. But the problem is, is that people got their own version of love. See, the Bible love is justice. Now, first thing I want to go to is one Psalms 101. Psalms 101. The Bible love is justice. You, you can't separate the two. In the Greek world, the Greeks tried to do that. And the Greco-Roman mentality runs with that. They separate justice from love. You know, love could be almost anything. You know, write a person a card. Oftentimes, love is, you know, the, 
just talk nice and don't be mean. That's what love me. Don't be mean. And I ask people, well, did Jesus of Nazareth lose his, his concept of love or did he lose love momentarily? Did charity escape him when he made a bullwhip premeditated? He made a bullwhip. He made that with an intent to go down to the temple and beat them thieves out of it. Now, I ask people at that time, did charity escape him? At that time, was it a moment of time when Jesus of Nazareth didn't know what love was? Oh, no, no, I, I, he, he knew what love was. And I argue he did it all in love and in righteous indignation, driving those money changers and those bankers out the temple. His whole demonstration was built on love. When he went down to the scribes, Sadducees, and Pharisees and called them a bunch of snakes and, 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 and um, stupid hypocrites, people say, well, the Bible don't say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He called them stupid hypocrites. You didn't know that? In fact, John did too. All you got to do is look up the words that he was using and you will find out and, and, and get yourself a good synonym finder. You'll find out that's what he was calling them. Stupid, snakes, hypocrites. Did he lose his love at that time? No, no, I don't think he lost his love. I think he set it straight. He was setting them straight because love is justice. That's what it is. That's what it is. Now, look, in Psalms 101, we want to know. The revolutionary despises or he hate all doctrines of the social order. And the doctrines of the social order is where the works of the men of this social order are founded upon. Now, we know that Psalms 101, it says this, because I said the Hebrew Bible is the revolutionary catechism. Let's see if it has the same sentiment. In Psalms 101, it argues, verse one, I will sing of mercy and judgment. Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Now, wait a minute. That's out of my King James. I want to read something to you as well. Like I said, you can find it. All you got to do is look up the word judgment. But I want to show you of those who did look the word judgment up. And this is out of the Jerusalem Bible. Now, this Bible used Yahweh. You understand? So I'm not, I, I don't get into the arguments. We use Lord, Yahweh, Yehoah. Some people, they get all hemmed up with that. And if you're one of those persons, then I might offend you tonight. But if you are some of those people who just trying to find some knowledge and understanding to get this thing going so we can inherit this kingdom, then it should be OK with you. Now, in uh, Psalms 101 out of the Jerusalem Bible, this is the ninth, I believe it was 1965 edition Jerusalem Bible. And I just want to read verse one to show you that what we're talking about here. Uh, it reads, my song is about kindness. So there you. They're associating in Psalms 101 in the King James mercy with kindness. All right. So in King James that I will sing of mercy and judgment here is saying my song is about kindness and justice. See, I like how they use that word there, but you will find the same thing if you look up judgment inside of your Strong's concordance. So my song is about kindness and justice. OK, number one. Now let's go, and, and it says here, Yahweh, I sing it to you. He's saying to Yah, I will sing of kindness and justice to you. All right, that's what his song is about. And since his song is about justice, let me finish it up in the Jerusalem Bible, and then we're going to go back to our King James. I mean to make good progress. See, he's petitioning in his song to Yah, to Yahweh or Yehoah about justice. And because of this, he's saying that I mean to make good progress. See, he know progress is made by doing justice. But notice this, as the blameless do, meaning those who are blameless, they know progress is made by doing justice. When will you come to me? In my household, I will advance in purity of heart. I will not let my eyes rest on any misconduct. Now, we're going to look at this in the King James. He said, I will not let my eyes rest. Because remember, he's singing of justice. And he said, I will not let my eyes rest on any misconduct. We see misconduct all the time. We see misconduct when we go shopping. We see misconduct in the ghettos. We see misconduct. Every time they cut us a check. All around the social system of the oppressor is misconduct. 
destroying the waters, fishing all, all of the waters, taking all of the fish out. They even eating up the unclean thing that clean the waters. Misconduct. They take their big tankers and they go and dump the oil in the waters. Misconduct. They go and dig deep, deep, deep into the waters and extract oil. Misconduct. Spill it all over the place. Killing fish and everybody else. Then they take the laborers to go dig deep in the earth to extract gold and diamonds and all of the precious metals. And they sell it, they buy it cheap and sell it high. Misconduct. Everywhere we look in the social society is misconduct. They teach our children lies in school. You go in there, they pledge an allegiance to a flag. Talking about, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And they say, so they say, to the republic for which it stands, right? One nation under God. We know that's a lie. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That's a lie. And you go in there and you, they, they got the children standing up reciting it, misconduct. I'm telling you, misconduct all over the place. Then the bad food that they shove down our children's throat because the capitalists trying to make profit and they shove, they, they sell us anything on the shelves and our grocery, so-called grocery stores. Misconduct. See, we set our eyes on misconduct all the time. What misconduct is he making reference to in the Psalms? Injustice. Remember, his song is to sing about justice. He will not let his eyes rest on any misconduct because the misconduct he's making reference to is injustice. He got to do something about it. Notice this. I hate, now that's in your Bible now. I hate the practices of the apostate. They have no appeal for me. I'm not interested in them. I hate the practices of the apostate. Now, what do you mean? All of your practices are built upon your knowledges and your sciences. So when we read in here, that the revolutionary despises all doctrines and refuses to accept them. He's talking about the doctrines that cause men to do injustice. Now, back in our King James, I will sing of mercy or kindness and judgment or justice Unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. Unto thee, O Yehovah, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. So now this is what he's making reference to, that he will not let his eyes behold any misconduct. So if he will not set a wicked thing before his eyes. Notice what else he's arguing. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Now, all of their works are built upon their doctrine and sciences. So when we read here that the revolutionary despises all doctrines and refuses to accept the mundane sciences to leave them to future generations, he despised them. He despised the sciences and what the sciences produce. That's why we're arguing or um, we're saying that to leave them for future generations, absolutely not. We don't even want to set them before us. They must be destroyed. They must be destroyed. Now, people say, well, you know, well, Yeshua, he's going to do that. No, he's going to do his part. Don't you know Yeshua said we got a part to do? And now we got to figure out what that part is. But we're reading hate. I hate the works. Now, what do you do? What, what, what do you do about that? Bear with me a moment. Back in our, turn your Bibles now to Revelation 19, because that's where we're going next. Revelation 19. 
the revolutionary, back in your document, section three, he knows only one science, right? The science of destruction. People say, well, brother, that's, man, what you talking about? We, the Bible just talking about love. That's right. I will sing of love or I will sing of justice. That's what the psalmist said. The psalmist was talking about love when he said he hate the works of those who turn aside. Turn to the Revelation chapter 19 now. Let's get to Revelation 19 because this is something that I am convinced that the religious world just don't want you to deal with. See, the religious world don't want you to deal with it. They don't really want you to deal with the Bible talking about or else the people can't make all this profit off religion. You know, the people, see, the modern day religion give the capitalist class the okay to go plunder the people. Religion gave the feudal class, the aristocrats in the feudal order to go plunder the people. You say, brother, what you talking about? That's who the popes were. They were the feudal lords who plundered the people and they established a religion to allow that. But when we start to study the scriptures, it, it teaches us, no, you just don't accept that. You just don't accept that. You got to think practically, people. If God going to do it, that's it. Look, if God going to do it without human participation, why didn't Jesus of Nazareth just come and Keep the Sabbath day and practice Judaism. Why did he? Why, why didn't he just come and just do religion? Why was he in the face of the ruling class? And then, why did he tell his disciples the works I do? You see, you understand? See, people want to do Yeshua works when they come down to laying hands and healing folks. You understand? But that was just a part of his work. But he said, the works that I do, you gonna do it. In fact, he said, it is for every student to be as his teacher or his master. And we don't wanna do none of these works. But those of us who don't, who didn't know, once we learn, see, once we learn better, we do better. Now, Psalm, now Revelation chapter 19, because we're arguing here, the revolutionary knows only one science, the science of destruction. For this reason, but for only this reason, he will study mechanics, physics, chemistry, and perhaps medicine. But all day and all night. In other words, he's going to study these different sciences, not for the social order like we discussed last week, but to use these sciences to aid in the revolution. Notice what Sergi's arguing, but all day and all night, he studies the vital sciences of human beings, their characteristics and circumstances and all the phenomenon of the present social order. Now, I'm not gonna read a scripture on that I'm going to explain this to you. If you examine Jesus of Nazareth's parables, our teacher in whom we are to follow and mimic, he's our pattern, he's our template. When you examine his parables, his parables reveals that he was a man himself who studied the vital science of sciences of human beings their characteristics and circumstances. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the circumstances between the ruling class and the poor, the parable between the man who was wounded going down to Jerusalem, the Good Samaritan parable, the circumstances between those in the society who called themselves religious, who didn't give aid to those who needed it, those who were wounded by thieves, but those who wasn't religious, like the Samaritan, who showed compassion upon a man who was wounded by thieves. 
all of these parables Yeshua was given shows that he did studies and he was fully aware of the characteristics and circumstances of human beings. He was fully aware of the phenomenon of the social order. Fully aware. That's why he gave the parable of the talents. He knew that in the Roman world, how much, how important it was for them to make a profit. And he used that example in his parable of the talent to show how much the servants of God got to work and labor for the kingdom. Because if the Romans going to cast you off because you didn't even put the money in the bank to make interest, boy, the kingdom of God not going to have no part with you. I'm giving you this parable. We have lessons on these parables, but I'm giving you the, that parable in particular, for example, because people believe that in that parable, the kingdom of God represented the man who wanted the interest. No, that's not the kingdom of God. In fact, the kingdom of God is in direct contrast to it if you continue to read the passage. In Matthew chapter 25, one parable showed the anticipation of the rich man who wanted his wealth by any means. And the man who didn't make money off of his invested capital, what he had was taken from him. He was worthless. That is in juxtaposition to the following example of those in the kingdom where when Messiah was saying, the servants of God aren't striving to make profit. The servants of God are striving to bring social justice. When you see me hungry, you gave me food. When you see me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When you see me without clothing, you gave me clothes to wear. And they said, well, master, when did we do that for you? He said, when you've done it for the least of my brother, you have done it for me. If you read the entirety of that parable, that was in contrast to the parable of the talent. I'm saying all this because this is what Yeshua knew. He understood the phenomenon of the present order. He understood how it was established, how it worked. He understood it. He understood the man with the barns had to exploit the people in order to build bigger barns. The problem is that the people today who call themselves servants of Yeshua do not study the sciences of human beings. They're not into social science. But now the Bible is teaching us we must be. And I believe that once we do it, the Bible will become clearer to us. But let me go on further now because I got you in Revelation chapter 19. The object is perpetually the same. Okay. And that is what? The surest and quickest way of destroying the whole filthy order. So he's studying a society like Yeshua studied the society. He studied the phenomenon of the social order. He studied the way human beings conducted themselves. What For what purpose? The destroying of the whole filthy social order. You got to. You got to study that social science in order to articulate clearly to the people why the kingdom of God will be more beneficial to you than the present world order. Some people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. All right. So Revelation 19, we're talking about the destruction of the whole filthy order. We're talking about the only science that the revolutionary knows is the science of destruction. OK. And you say, brother, well, you reading that that document right there, man, the Bible talks of love. That's right. That's right. And we're going to read about a little bit of love in a few minutes. Revelation chapter 19. And when we get to Revelation chapter 19, people. Let's start at verse 11. Revelation 19 and verse 11. It reads, And I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was faithful and true, and in righteousness, look it up, justice. It means justice. And in justice, he doth judge and make war. You mean a God of heaven is sending forth his servant to go judge and make war against what? 
that filthy, despicable social order. And everyone who are who's built upon the filth of this social order, all the beneficiaries, direct and indirect of this social order who don't want to see it perish, he's coming to judge and make war. Now notice this. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And notice this, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. So every nation is ruled by a social order. And these nations are being destroyed along with their filthy social order. This here is speaking of what? Destruction. Destruction of what? The nations or the filthy social order. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations. He shall rule them with the rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. See, the revolutionary despises all the doctrines and refuses to accept the mundane sciences and leaving them for the future generations. He's destroying those social orders. They got to be destroyed. The object is perpetually the same. The quickest way of destroying the whole filthy order. See, in Revelation 19, we're talking about the destruction of the filthy social order. You're not going off to heaven. You're going to possess the planet, the meek of the earth, the righteous men and women of the earth. You're going to possess the planet and you got to know how to govern it. You cannot recreate what God is planning to destroy. Destruction is on the menu. Is that what we're talking about? Well, wait a minute now. We're not done. Let's go to Daniel chapter seven. Turn with me to Daniel chapter seven. Now, what's being destroyed when he's destroying the nations? Just like the psalmist said, the workers of the apostates or the wicked. I hate, the psalmist said, the works of those who turn aside. I hate their works. And these social systems of the nations are built upon the doctrines and sciences in which the revolutionaries of God hate. See, if he didn't hate it, he wouldn't be destroying it. Now, notice this. And you got to learn to hate it, not tolerate it, hate it. See, if you don't hate it, then you're not, you, 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 you're bound to not really want it to go. You understand what I'm saying? See, I go out there, I have to tell myself when, I, when we go out in the street, go out, I went out there a little bit today. And, you know, you get people who take, take the information. You get people who reject the information. You get people who say, no, I'm good. I'm good. See, they straight. They good. Especially, you know, because I come from work sometimes. Like I say, I'm a plumber. So when I go up to people sometimes, I have literature. I'm, I often wonder, it depends on where you catch me. Catch me on the weekend, I might be dressed as something different, but I, I'm coming right from plumbing. You don't dress good when you, when, when, you know what I'm saying? You dress to work. But out in the street, when I'm passing out flyers coming from work, I look like when I'm going up to somebody, it look like I'm about to ask them for some change or something. You understand what I'm saying? So when I come up to them, they are already out of defense. You know, you understand what I'm saying? And that's their problem. That's their problem. Because even if I wanted something from them, if they were upright, they would at least hear it. But you have a lot of pride and arrogance. You understand? And then you give it to people, especially those who are, you know, you see them getting out of their nice cars. Or they, or they, you know, they got their briefcases. 
Oh, you can't hand them nothing. They don't even want you to get close to them. In fact, they offended that you even looked at them. You understand? I've seen people the way that they look back, like they mad that you even looked at them. How dare you? See, that's what I've seen in the aristocrats. And they don't know that their judgment is coming. And every opportunity that they had, they, were, they only want to hear it. Why? Because how they judging it. How they judging it. They don't even want to hear it. And those who are built upon this social order, those who love this social order, you're going to perish with this social order. You want to perish with it. So you got to learn to hate it. Everybody don't hate it because some are beneficiaries. Some are beneficiaries. Exactly, sister. You got to hate it. Shalom, brother. Shalom, brother Clyde Byrne. Shalom. How you doing today? If you don't hate it, you're not going to want to change it. Now, people say, well, we can't change it. Yes, you have to realize the power that is available to you. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Don't let a Hindu, and I'm not taking anything per se away, you know, from Mohandas. You understand? Mohandas Gandhi. I've seen his faults. He says some stuff that he needed to be corrected on. But don't let a man use Jesus of Nazareth's teachings and outdo you. He proved, don't let this man use the, see, Mohandas Gandhi used these teachings of the Hebrew Revolutionary Catechism to liberate the Indians from British rule. He, that's what he used. He said he used them. Well, Gandhi was a Hebrew. I mean, Gandhi was a, uh, a Hindu. That's what he was that by birth. That, that, the Hindu religion didn't help Gandhi liberate the, the Indians. The Hebrew Bible did. That's what he said. His own words. So we got proof it works. Now we got to realize the power is in our hands. Get all the propaganda of the capitalists out of our minds. Get all, you know, because they teach us not to have faith. The only thing they teach us is to have faith in them and what they produce. And then they teach us that, you know, we can't do nothing. Just sit back. We got to get that out of our minds. Daughter, believe me, I feel you. Long time, long time. I had a whole lot of trouble coming up because I, I hate it. Now we got to learn how to defeat it. And our God promised that he will be with us in doing it. In fact, he's waiting for us to do our part. He said, when he looked, was there not a man? And that, with the prophet Isaiah, he told Isaiah, he looked down upon the sons of men and see if there are any willing to do justice. The creator said, we, his instruments, when will we be used to glorify his name, to crush the oppressor? He's going to do marvelous works through his servants. Now, Brothers and sisters, Daniel chapter seven, the destruction of the world of the social order. And I'm saying once we start understanding this and we begin to organize properly, getting all backbiting out, humbling ourselves to the movement and what's better for the movement and not how we feel. You understand? No leaders ego tripping and realize that the people themselves. They are the people of the movement who need to be looked upon as co-heirs, not, okay, you just this and I'm, I'm up here. Uh-uh. No, no. No. What the Messiah say about the leaders, the best leaders, you servants, signifying. Man, get rid of this hierarchy, man. We got to have a democracy. But in order for a democracy to be successful, 
Everyone inside of the unit must be educated. You got to be educated to have the same goals. Okay, or else it'll be confusion and chaos. And once we get organized, and I and that process is happening, don't let it leave you behind. I don't want it to leave me behind because it, everything going according to plan. See, the train is coming through. Now the most high want to see who's going to get on board. Daniel chapter 7. Are we speaking of destruction? Are we speaking of destruction? Daniel chapter 7. And when we get to Daniel chapter 7, bear with me a little bit. Went a little bit too far. When we get to this Daniel chapter 7, notice carefully. The objective of the revolutionary is to destroy the whole filthy order, right? Day and night, that's what he's thinking about. We've got to get armed with the knowledge on what to do. Daniel chapter 7. And when we get to Daniel chapter 7, I want to read verse 23. Verse 23 reads, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So this kingdom we're reading about that's going to devour the earth and break it down in pieces, how is it breaking it down? Through its social order. The social system of this kingdom will destroy and break the earth down. And the people in it. So this fourth beast shall be diverse from all kingdoms. Many of us argue that this fourth beast is Rome. America and the Western world and Britain, for example, Britain and Germany are all a part of the Roman Empire. And the last vestiges of this dreadful and terrible beast exist with us today. And they're doing the same thing, destroying and treading down the earth and breaking it in pieces by way of what? Their social order. Now, notice this. Remember, when you're reading kingdom, by default, you're adding a social order. Now, wait a minute now. What do verse 26 say? But the judgment shall sit. And they shall take away his dominion, the dominion of the ruler of that fourth kingdom or the social order that's destroying the earth. His dominion shall be taken away. See, he's not going to give it to you. The world kingdoms and the social order not going to hand it over. No, the Bible says it's going to be taken. Revelation said he shall judge and make war. Look around you. The creator is doing his part. He shall take it. Wait a minute now. But the judgment shall sit. They shall take away his dominion and consume, to consume, and to what? Destroy it. To destroy the social order of the fourth kingdom. It just so happened America, Britain, in fact, many other countries, China and the rest of them, they are all following the social order of the fourth kingdom. And that social order shall be destroyed. And that is the objective of the revolutionary. The quickest way of destroying the whole filthy order. The only thing and only science he knows in your document is the science of destruction. So when we're talking about the kingdom of God, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 8, Psalms chapter 2, Psalms 72, Psalms 149. If this is on your mind, the only thing on your mind is the destruction of the social order. The total destruction of this filthy order. And listen, we don't need no guns. We don't need no guns now. Come on, talk to me, daughter. What you saying? I do hate it already. Been hating it ever since. Okay, you, I, okay, we read that one. And it's worth repeating. Been hating it ever since. Hate it. Now, I want to read something to you. Because one thing that Mr. 
uh, served he didn't know about was the power of the God of Abraham. But he was on the right track. That's why we have a lot of comrades out there who don't know the God of Israel, but have the same sentiment. And if we could learn it, boy, we got a whole lot of people to join rank. But let me show you something here about the power of the Elohim that we're dealing with. Anybody ever hear of Lisbon, the great rich city in Portugal? Because some people think this is a joke, you know, uh, a fire, the power of Elohim. I told you his weather, his rain, his storm. See, the creator said he made a covenant with the water. Bear with me a little bit now. I want you to feel this. The creator said he made a covenant with the water that it will not go beyond his boundaries. Well, don't you know that assumes some form of intelligence in the waters? There's a covenant being made between God and the waters. The waters move. They deal with his bidding. And you know, the only time that the waters exceed or go beyond their boundaries, it got to be by a commandment. You understand what I'm saying? Because normally they hit their way, they hit the beach and they roll right back. But every now and again, the earth God made is in communication with him. He said the earth mourns. He told the children of Israel, earth going to spit you out. Even though the earth is in a high, is in a, a high intelligence as a human being, it's alive. It's life all in it, right? Isn't it made of cells and stuff like that? Protons, neutrons, see what makes up the very gases of the air. The very fabric of the tree is all alive. The earth itself, how can something dead bring forth something living? How can something dead bring, uh, sustain living organisms that you find in abundance in the waters? The earth itself is one living organism. And the divine intelligence made covenants with it. In other words, he commands it to do his bidding. So he said, look at here, the water is under commandment, right? It's under commandment to not exceed his boundaries, all right? He told Job, I got snow, I got hell reserved. He told Job, have you ever looked into the treasures of snow? Have you ever looked into the treasures of hell, meaning the hailstone that fall out the sky? or lightning, or wind. Have you ever looked into these treasures? But the creator says that the hell and the snow are reserved for the day of battle. For the day of battle. The hell and the snow are his cannons. The hell dropping from the sky are his, they're his bombs. That phenomenon of fire, and lightning, they're all used and commanded. The clouds of heaven, they're bid, some bid, he bids them sometimes to descend from the heavens and touch the earth in the form of a typhoon or a tornado. And they do his work. So I'm saying all this because I'm going to read to you an account. Lisbon, Portugal. Rich city, Richmond, 1755. Look it up. Look it up. What happened in Lisbon, Portugal? That's when the rich folks was acting a fool. They was, they was burning up slaves. Anybody who went against the Catholic social order or the social order of the aristocrats, they were heretics. They were destroyed. Burning them at the stake. Now notice what happened to Lis Lipson when Lisbon, when the ruling class got too strong for the people, a divine intervention. Now, now I'm going to read something to you. This is out of the World Book Encyclopedia. I got to bring this in here because I want you to understand the power of our Elohim. I want you to understand the power of our Elohim. Portugal. A small nation with a long history. This is volume nine of the World Book Encyclopedia. 
a small nation with a long history is now regarded as one of Europe's stable republics. Though revolutionary attempts to restore the old monarchy have, se have several times been made. All right, now I want to get down to something. They're going to talk about the cities of Portugal. Cities. Of the numerous cities of Portugal, two are outstanding. These are Lisbon, famous as the most beautifully situated capital city in Europe, with the exception of Constantinople. Now, that's the one I want to read about. I'm not going to worry about the second one. Lisbon, what happened there? The immediate successor of Venus, or Venice, in the early modern period as the maritime queen of the Western world is majestically situated on a low range of hills overlooking the Tagus or the Tagus River at a spot where the stream broadens with a width of nine miles about uh, with a width of about nine miles about seven miles from the ocean. Notice what they call in this place. Its harbor is one of the finest in the world, deep, well sheltered, and large enough to hold the uh, the night. Excuse me, and large enough to hold the navies of Europe. Okay, large harbor. And I want to show you something. In fact, I read it. Did you catch this part? It was a maritime queen. That's what they call Lisbon. A queen who sat upon the waters. One of the cleanest cities of Europe, Lisbon, has a splendid water supply. Here, no, it has a splendid water supply. The old quarter lies under the shadow of Moorish castle walls and presents many curious sights along the steep, narrow thoroughfares. Here, no wagons pass, for the poor carry their burdens on their heads and the more prosperous load their donkeys. Brother Judah, why, why are you reading all this? Notice how the poor is being treated. I had to read that part to show you how the poor is being treated. It was a rich city, rich city. Upon the waters, glorious city of Europe. Previous to 1147, Lisbon was taken three times by the Christians from the Moors. It has suffered severely from several earthquakes. Now we're getting down to our point. And has been the victim of plagues. But the greatest disaster experienced was the earthquake of 1755. The earthquake of 1755, when in less than 10 minutes, notice this, the earthquake of, you can look, Google it right now, earthquake of 1755 in Lisbon in Portugal. In less than 10 minutes, most of the city was reduced to a heap of ruins. How in the heck can you have a, a luxurious city in less than 10 minutes reduced? to a heap of stones by earthquake. See, what I'm saying is this, is that it just didn't happen. The earth is not a fluke. Everything we're dealing with, I'm trying to tell you in the revolutionary struggle, we got a power that is beyond anything that the Gentiles have ever seen. They see glimpses of his power, just like Lisbon had. 10 minutes. Now, I'm not finished now. Earthquake, 10 minutes, level the city, right? Now let's go into the Encyclopedia Britannica, Lisbon, and find out what else happened with the earthquake. I'm going to read it to you, but I'm going to give you a heads up so you know where we're going. After the earth earthquake hit, the people ran to level grounds. They ran to level ground because the buildings and everything was falling. So they ran to clear grounds. And you know what the clear grounds were? They were on the coast. They were on the coast of 
lit uh, uh, of the sea. And 90 minutes after the earthquake, what happened next? A tsunami. So the people who escaped the earthquake, that same, all this happening in the same day. In 90 minutes, as soon as the people could get away from the earthquake that y'all had sent, they all ran to the coast, to the flatlands, and y'all met them with 90 minutes later with the tsunami. Now listen, this is all the history now. Oh, you seen the documentary? If you can't post it, Lisbon. The name Lisbon is a modification of the ancient name Olispio. Olisipio, excuse me. It became the seat of the archbishop in 1390, the seat of government in 1422. During the 16th century, it gained much wealth. Notice the pattern. Notice the pattern. As the aristocrat gains wealth, he oppresses the people. See, this is that filthy social order that Lisbon was ruled by. And Yah destroyed that filthy social order in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. But nevertheless, during the 16th century, it gained much in wealth and splendor from the establishment of the Portuguese empire in Indian Africa. <clears throat> from 1580 to 1640, Lisbon was a provincial town under Spanish rule. For many centuries, the city has suffered from earthquakes. And on November 1st, 1755, the greater part of it was reduced almost in an instant to a heap of ruins. A tidal wave at the same time broke over the quays and wrecked the shipping and the Tagus. Fire broke out to complete the work of destruction. So no sooner than they fled from the from the from the earthquake to the coast, a tidal wave or a tsunami came and wiped them out. Now they fleeing from the tsunami and going back to the city, and now they met by fire. And what plays the part in the fire? The wind. All of these are the instruments of God. The water was summoned to now be allowed to go beyond its borders to consume the inhabitants. The earth was summoned to quake and the wind was used to spread the fires. To the Gentiles, this fluke, but to those who know the God of heaven, that's divine justice. Now, look what we're learning here. And the value of the property destroyed was about 20 million pounds. The shock was felt from Scotland to Asia Minor. Now, I figured I wanted to read that because to know that you're not in it alone. You're not in this alone. But there's something dreadful about Lisbon. It wasn't just rich people that got consumed. Everybody didn't get consumed. But it wasn't just rich people. See, see, remember what Revelation said? It should be a mighty quake and people should run to the clefts of the rocks. Rich or the mighty and the bond and the free. We got to get this in order. The creator is summoning us to do a business a job. Why? Because he made a promise to his friend Abraham. And as the God of heaven live, you're going to fulfill the promise. And if it's not you, it's going to be someone else. But they're going to fulfill the promise. Like he told Moses, listen, I destroy everybody in this wilderness and I raise up some children to Abraham. John the Baptist said, look here, he'll raise up stones first. He's going to get the job done, in other words. Do you want to be a part of it or do you want to be the ones that's consumed? If you don't, if you want to be a part of it, gird up your loins. 
and proceed to be organized to march forward to the war because we are at war and we must pray and begin to study to learn how to destroy the social order, right? And Daniel chapter 7 and 26, he shall consume and destroy it. Just, you know, all of this works together. We're going to do our part. And God of heaven showed us he'll do his part just by looking at Lisbon in Portugal. He showed that he'll do his part. He always shows us. And then Daniel says in Daniel 7 and 27, after the despicable social order is destroyed and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. Who is it going to be given to? All of the resources of the earth. It shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high whose kingdom or whose new social order whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him him all dominions that means there shall be a total annihilation a total destruction of the world social orders. So when we're talking about this revolutionary catechism, that the servant of God or the revolutionary knows nothing. He only knows one science, I should say, and that is the science of destruction. The only science we know of is the destruction of the social order. But section four reads this. Spain at one time, Shalom Ed. Spain at one time was the beast, best navy and imperialist power. That is so, as far as I understand as well. And notice what Sister Pat posted. The doc, if you want to see the documentary on Lisbon, it is on YouTube. Okay. Now, the section four reads back to our catechism. So we know so far, Sergi's on point. The revolutionary, only thing on his mind is the destruction of the filthy social order. That's what's on his mind. Okay. Now, section four reads this. The revolutionary despises public opinion. He despises and hates the existing social morality in all its manifestations, right? Public opinion. What is that all about? Yeah, that's all, Ed, yeah. Back on the scene, he done made it back on the scene. Made it back in the frame. Now, public opinion, what is that? Attitudes, beliefs, and views prevalent among the general populace. So the revolutionary despises public opinion. Anything, the views that's prevalent. Look at the injustice here. Look at it, ethnic divisions, the exploitation and... um plundering of the women of the earth, the plundering of the earth, rent, retail, usury. You, you understand what I'm saying? The privatization of land and resources. The attitudes and belief of public opinion is okay with that. They're okay with that. The foul breads the foul meat and bread that's brought to the table. When I mean bread, I mean food. Everywhere you look, the table of the Gentiles are, is filthy. Public opinion. And what do the filth of the Gentiles bring? Curses, vexation, sicknesses. Everything written in the book of, book of Deuteronomy. He said, if you fail to keep my laws in which public opinion rejects the laws of God, 
He said, if you fail to keep my laws, the curses in this book and the plagues in this book and the plagues that's not in the book of the law shall he send upon us. So we must reject and despise whatever attitudes and belief prevail among the populace in his land. The revolutionary despises and hates the existing social morality. Now, <clears throat> the social morality is none other than the morals and the views of the society. You know that society that say two men could get married? You, you know the general, uh, the public opinion and the, and the society or where it's, it's, uh, they will call a man a woman now because he put on a dress and a wig and take a few shots, okay? A few hormone shots to begin growing breasts. You know, they call them a woman. No, I, I don't give no. And you know, that's a smack in the face to women. Women, you shouldn't even appreciate that. He's a, I, he's a man, transgender, whatever. You are a man, but because of social morality of the land, no. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. So we must reject, right? Social morality and all his manifestations. But hold on now. For him, meaning a revolutionary, morality is everything which contributes to the triumph of the revolution. Now, is this true? Our morality is the morality that will contribute to the revolution. Now, that's one of the obstacles because a lot of people don't realize what that is. So you have, like I tell people, they don't like to hear it now, but I tell people, look, you're a business owner. You call yourself a believer. See, the public opinion is, is that a boss could rob his workers to make profit. See, but... The revolutionary believes that morality is everything which contributes to the triumph of the revolution. That means all capitalist practices, exploitation, robbery must be crushed. It must be destroyed. But if you don't know how to, how to identify these things, you could very well be contributing to the public opinion. See, the public opinion says it's okay to rent out a place on this earth to your neighbor. They, they See, they say that's okay. All right. It's immoral for one to believe that he shouldn't be charged a fee to live on a planet. You understand? No, nothing else got to pay to live on this planet. Bird, he ain't got to pay no rent to live in the trees. Nobody got to pay. Nothing else got to pay but the human being. And according to the general consensus of the public, according to the morals of this land, that's okay to do. So it, I'm just naming just a couple. It got to be done away with. The point is it must be done away with. And everything that leads to the revolution must be brought to the table. Now, one more thing here. Immoral and criminal is everything that stands in its way. So everything that stands in the way of the revolution or AKA the kingdom of God is immoral. It's immoral. Now he said, look, he got a, he despised public opinion. He despises it. He hates the existing social morality in all of its manifestations. Well, notice this here in Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Go to Psalms 139. People talk about love. They say, read the good book. It's a book of love. We don't read about destruction of the, of the social orders. We don't read about hating the works of the doers of iniquity or those who promote and uplift the filthy social order. 
And then in Psalm 139, going to tell us something else. Psalms 139. You know Jesus of Nazareth used the Psalms all the time. And remember, if you want to know about Yeshua ben Yosef or Yeshua of Nazareth, if you want to know the entirety of his social revolutionary activities and sentiment, you've got to read the prophets. You've got to read the prophets. That's what he told you. If you want to identify him as the one, then you've got to read the prophets. Now, let's go to Yada Yahuwah. Shalom to you. Shalom to you. Psalms 139. Let's see if Psalm 139 will support sentiment four. The revolutionary despises public opinion. He despises and hates the existing social morality and all its manifestations. Immoral and criminal is everything that stands in his way. Now notice what Psalms 139 says, starting at verse 19. Surely, this is Psalms 139. Verse 19, surely thou wilt slay the wicked, O Elohim, or O God. Depart from me, therefore, ye bloody men. I, you know, I read some of this stuff and so many, I, and I don't like to take a whole lot of detours and I want to keep you out here all night, but research what it means to be a bloody man. Research what it means, and I'll give you a clue. All of the buildings, the clothing, the food in the grocery stores, they're all commodities of blood. See, these bloody men are men who have used the labor, blood, sweat, and tears of the masses of the people to produce, produce wealth. And this is what the Bible means by bloody men or cities of blood. Cities that's built upon the exploitation of their neighbor. Okay? So he's saying here, depart from me, ye bloody men. These are the exploiters of the earth. And when he say depart from him, the scriptures teaches us. He's not just going to ask them to depart. The scripture teaches us that the God of heaven and his servants will be, will make sure that these bloody men depart from the earth. Either conform to the new order or die. Comply to it or perish. Now look, depart from me, ye bloody men, for they speak against thee wickedly, and thine enemies take thy name in vain. He's saying that these wicked Gentiles these nations speak against the God of heaven wickedly. Surely they do every day. Verse 21, do not I hate them, O Lord, O Adonai? Do not I hate them, O Jehovah, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Well, people say you're not supposed to hate. Well, it's a context to that hate. Are you hating the being as a person or are you hating their activities and their deeds? See, that being in that person, in this context, righteous indignation or hate is applied to them. But if that being or that person repents, then they become your brother. Now, to just hate the being, you hate them whether they're good or bad. That's what the Bible rejects. That's why the scriptures say, don't hate your neighbor without cause. And then they say, well, Yeshua said, well, you know what? You know, thou shalt love thy enemies. You know what that means? Do justice to them. See, sometimes justice is a rod to the back. 
You understand what I'm saying? See, Solomon said that. He said, a, a rod is made for a fool's back. In the legislation of Moses, which was the legislation of justice, when somebody act a fool, love was performed upon them in the form of a rod. That's why I told you when Yeshua went down there into the temple, he the Bible said he made the bull whip. He didn't make the bull whip to scratch his back. He made the bull whip with the intent to premeditate it, to show a demonstration of love. So what we're saying here, all those who rebel against the creator. The psalmist said they're hated with a perfect hatred. Now, if they repent, they no longer fall into this category. You got to understand what we're saying. But if they don't repent, then they will perish. So this isn't saying hate your enemies. In fact, we're talking about the enemies of God, right? This isn't saying hate your enemies being, I should say. If your enemies repent, you do well for them. If you see them needing something, you still do justice. You still do justice because you can win them over so they can conform to the right way. It's not, that's that's righteous indignation, which we're talking about hatred here. Not just hatred because you've got this personal hatred and you just want to see somebody die because you just don't give a damn about them. That's the kind of hatred that most people used to. But this is not the hatred that the Bible is talking about. You understand what we're saying? This here is just talking about despising perfectly all those who work wickedness. It's talking about despising perfectly all those who come up with these public opinions of injustice, their morals despising it. Why? Because they despise the ways of the Almighty. Let's follow up with this. Let's go to Psalms 119. Let's follow up with this to find out what we're talking about. He said with a perfect hatred. Now, that's in your Bible, though. That's in your Bible. That, that perfect hatred, that righteous indignation, Psalms 119. Psalms 119, verse 158. <clears throat> it reads, I beheld the transgressors. I was grieved. He said he was grieved because they kept not thy word. This is what he's talking about in that earlier Psalms. This is what he's making reference to. The ones with that per, who, who is hated with the perfect hatred by the servants of the Almighty. And people say, well, that's not you. That was Yeshua. Well, you saying Yeshua hated somebody? Put the hate in its proper context. Those who are of that despicable social order. Couple it with justice that those of that despicable social order, if they repent and join rank, then they become one of the brothers. And when I mean brothers, I'm talking about the brotherhood of man, which means men and women. Okay. I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. I was grieved at the transgressors because they kept not thy word. Now, if you look it up in the Hebrew, you know what it means? Disgust. I was disgusted with the transgressors. Downright disgusted. Or look in a synonym finer, despised. Now, these are the ones who make up this present day social order. Now, if you're disgusted with the present day social order, really disgusted with it, 
Don't you know it's time now for the people who are disgusted with it and who are repenting to learn what needs to be done? And I'm telling you to hit the ground running. First and foremost, you must begin to bring the information of the revolution. Now it's time to tap into the ignorant masses and teach them the necessity of the revolution. And I warn you that when we do that effectively, then it will be proven like we read in sections one and two, we will become the implacable enemy of the social order. But as long as we sit down and don't do nothing, they're not going to worry about it. See, now it's time to pool our resources. You understand? Perform experiments. Now it's time to do what John was saying. Those of you with two coats, give your brother one. And your brother who need a coat, he better not be an exploiter. He, that, that brother who need, because don't believe just because you're poor that you're part of the revolution. You got some snakes who's poor. Okay? We ran across some of them too. They, they're poor exploiters. They are the people who's poor but they bad as the exploiter. Now it's time to pool the resources. We can no longer hide behind our homes. We can't hide behind, you know, wherever we dwell. We got to come out. Like we issue was calling his men out. Come on out. I got to make you fishers of men. Now you got to teach others to despise the social order. You got to teach others now. And how do you do that? How do you teach others about this social order? It goes back to section three. It goes back to section three. All day and night, he, the revolutionary, studies. He studies the vital science of human beings. This is social science. He studies social science their characteristics and circumstances. You got to be able to break this down because the capitalist and the oppressor is going to teach they the best thing going. The preacher's going to teach, don't worry about it, you're going to float out to heaven. Now it takes the revolutionaries of the Bible to show you need both of them a lie. And now we got to take the necessary steps to take the earth. And when we do what we're supposed to do, Seize the planet, God gonna rise up and protect us and do what he's gonna do, just like we read about Lit, 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 Lisbon. He works, he works in the sons of men among the sons of men all the time. Now, let's get ready to wrap it up a little bit. Wait a minute now. I make it my duty to perceive the government officials being addressed in the scriptures for a clear understanding of who was being addressed as wicked or transgressors. And you're saying that as you're searching the scriptures, you begin to understand who the Bible is making reference to predominantly when it's making reference to the rich, right? If, if I follow you correctly, uh, Yehuda, if I follow you correctly. Because again, when we do read about the wicked, they put that anywhere. But the Bible is specifically talking about a certain manner of people. And that certain manner of people are the ones who ran off with all of the resources. Printed up some tickets that they call money. Threw that out to us and said, here, you're going to slave for us to get these tickets. And now when you get these tickets, you can buy back the stuff we took. Or we're going to show some charity and we're going to share with you. I hate to hear that. You know, a Negro going to sit up here and I'm using this as a demeaning thing. You know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about black and this and that. I'm talking about, you know, the the, the, the wicked. Wicked man going to come up and take your, your, your coat and your shoes. He going to come and take your coat and your shoes. And then when you demand them to release your goods, your necessities you need to live, he's going to talk about he's going to share it with you. How in the hell are you going to share something that belonged to me? 
You what do you mean you're gonna share the resources? What do you mean you're gonna give a well, I mean you seized all of the land which belongs to man, just as well as the sun is divided up among all humanity and the clouds and the rain, so it is with the land and the water and the resources. It belongs to humanity. And you're going to get some damnable devil going to sit up here and say, you know, well, you know, we should share with the uh, underprivileged, with the have nots. The hell are you talking about share? No. You're going to give back what rightfully belongs to the people. That's what you're going to do. And how do I have the authority to say that? Because the prophets say it. Violently if needs be. Just like the he spoke in the book of Job. God will cause the ruling class to vomit up everything that he has swallowed down. And if you look at the analogy, vomiting is a violent act. Okay. That's your body going into something that, yeah, that, that don't really feel comfortable. Talking about he going to share, going to share something that belongs to the people. So what we're looking at, we got to study this. We have to understand it. I have been speak, I have went out and spoken with people. And we talked about their wages being robbed. And I have heard people say that they don't, you know, because they was arguing about raising the wage of $15 an hour. I have heard people argue because they've been so mentally destroyed that they don't believe that they deserve $15 an hour. They say they don't believe they deserve it. Now, you have to have one hell of an ideology flowing through your social system to beat the people down so bad that they don't even believe they deserve their natural God-given rights. And what I mean by that, not $15 an hour per se, but it's what you use the $15 an hour to get. How is it that you have persuaded so many people to convince them that it has become the public norm. It has become the prevalent views among the general public that you got to pay for what you need. Now, that's something. That's one hell of a deception that we believe we got to pay for what we need. We believe that we have to earn a living. Think about it. Listen to it. You have to earn the right to live. You got to earn a living. Who told us that? Who gave us this ideology? What knowledges and sciences did this come from? That we must earn and buy what we need. And that's why the social order must be destroyed. And the people must learn now, you've been tricked. You've been robbed. And you, as the people, have the power. Why? Because God gave it to you. And sad to say, it's the deceived poor people who's destroying the earth. The rich man actually not doing it himself. He's persuaded through his knowledges, his sciences. He has persuaded the people to do it. That got to be the best game going, where you could persuade the people to undermine themselves into captivity. You have persuaded the people to put the noose around their own necks. And that's why the revolutionary must study social science and the phenomenon of the present social order. The phenomenon of the present social order. 
how it operates, how it operates in secret. It's in secret. Maybe most high willing, we're going to do a lesson on that. Immoral and criminal is everything that stands in the way of the revolution. You got to believe that it got to take root. Because once it take root, then we will perform. You understand? Once we realize that we are at war and realize it where it takes root, where you're like, listen, other forces, in order for us to survive, we're going to have to be drawn together. You understand? Don't let us fall into a calamity where our back is against the wall before we come to this decision. Let us come to this decision now. And perhaps the God of Israel will spare us when he's inflicting his judgments and rebukes upon the earth. When he's sending his typhoons and hurricanes and earthquakes and lightning and wind. When he's sending his hailstones that's dropping out of heaven, that's breaking and shattering car windows, killing, killing cattle. Let us be in the right place that he will spare us. And that's why we're talking about what we're talking about right now. We have to find ourselves in the right place. Real quick now. Have we established that the revolutionary, he's grieved. He's grieved. He despises the psalmist say. He despises the transgressors. The transgressors and the workers of iniquity are hated with a perfect hatred. A pure hatred. Because of their activities. And people say, well, brother, how can you teach hate and love? You got to study the Bible. You got to study the Bible because your perceptions and how you conceive hate may be misplaced. You have to study it. And consider diligently what's set before you. All right. What manner of hate the Bible is dealing with. And this hate is to drive us to redeem our brother out of this social system. That's how it works together. If we can get him to repent, the social system crumbles. If he remains a dedicated patriot of the social system, then the Bible says he gonna perish too, okay? So that's one reason, another reason why the God of heaven is saying, listen, spread the message, cause the people to break rank, Tell them to depart out of the Babylonian social system. Section five. We're not reading the whole thing tonight. All right. So don't 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 get afraid now. We're not reading the whole thing tonight. Yes. Earn a living. You understand? Earn a living. What do you say here? Because the officials are the ones David and the prophets wrestled with. That's right. That's right. You see, remember when David fled to the cave of Adulam? If you look the word Adulam, it means justice. He fled to the cave of justice. And all of the nobles and aristocrats wanted David's head. That's why Nabal didn't want to give David no relief. Because David and all of the people who had left and left their masters fled to the cave of Adulam, to the cave of justice. And Nabal didn't want to give David none of that bread when his men was hungry. He accused David of convincing the people to depart from their masters. That's right, you leave your masters, they ain't got nobody to do the work. Understand and be enlightened and find that your masters, the masters of the world don't have no power. They have power in so much as they manipulate us. As soon as we break the shackles of their deception, they, they, they get flushed down the damn toilet. They have no power. Their money don't mean nothing. Don't you know that the ruling class isn't in existence because of money? 
people teach it's another thing that the people in the world teaches us according to the doctrines and the sciences of this world. It's another fallacy. You ever hear of it? It's called financial security. You ever hear that? Financial security. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. The capitalist system could drop out tomorrow. 1930 showed it wasn't no such thing of uh, financial security or economic security. There's no such thing. It's a lie. The capitalists themselves, the ruling class themselves, don't live off of their money. Their security isn't in their money in the bank. You know where their security is? In the people. It always been. It is in the deception of the people and writing the backs of the people. Our security isn't in money. It's always been in one another. See, in, you can see it better in the village life. You don't need no, you didn't need no uh, uh, insurance plan. Your insurance plan was the next generation who's going to take care of your family and your sons if something happened to you. There is no such thing as financial security. Proof is if all of the workers today left America, if all of the workers left America, all that money and gold in the vaults, all them paper dollars that they got security guards guarding in the, in the vaults, it wouldn't do them capitalists a damn bit of good. You understand me? If every worker left America today, all of these stones and diamonds and gold and silver and all of their dollars and their property and their buildings and their factories and their airplanes and their trains and their buses and boats, everything. If all the workers left it today and let, let the capitalists have it all, you will find out that their money was not their security. Their security was always riding the backs of the people. It's the people with the power. It's the people with the value. It's not the things. They have persuaded us to believe that. So we going to think that we going to create financial security and hoard money in the banks. We going to, no, no, we smart though. We're not going to take dollars. We're going to put gold away. You can't eat a gold. You can't make nothing out of gold. You, you know what I'm saying? You can't chew on it. Well, you could chew on it if you want. But it don't bring you nothing, do it. No nourishment. Nothing. So all your paper dollars and your gold, you set into the side. And the day that the economy drop out and no man buy the merchandise anymore, what of your gold? What did James say? It's canker. Your gold and your silver. And your commodities, it's cankered. It's rust, moth eaten. James declaring to you, it's worthless. It's always been worthless. The only reason why their dollar have value is because of the people. And I'm repeating this over and over again to you to realize that we have free access to the people. Let them guard their banks. Let them guard all of their facilities. We want the people. That's what we want. Because without the people, the capitalist is nothing. Nothing. And that is the new. How do we learn that? How do we come to these conclusions? Because we have studied the vital science of human beings and their characteristics and circumstances. We have studied the phenomenon of the present social order. When you study the present social order and the phenomenon of the present social order, you begin to see what really has value and what really has the power. So a revolutionary should study it, right? Five now, let's get to five, five. Shalom, Micah, shalom, Micah. Man, brother, good to see you on with us again. Hang in there, my brother. Hang on in there. We got to get in contact. 
when, you know, I, we keep putting it out there, open invitation, open invitation. And when we're saying get in contact, we're not just talk, not talking about, hey, how you doing? How are things going? Okay, once we finish establishing that, y'all is good. He's blessed us. All right. Now, let's sit down. We're going to have to schedule some meetings here and see how we're going to be able to do this. And we have to see who got strong points, who got weak points, who need help here, who got talent with this, who got talent with that, who got resources with this, who got resources with that. That's what we're going to have to learn. That's what we're going to have to do. And this is something that we have put in practice already. So we inviting the people to come down to the table to have further discussions. OK, why? Five reads this. The revolutionary is a dedicated man. Dedicated. Yeshua explained that, didn't he? When you put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Don't look back. See, the revolutionary is a dedicated man, merciless towards the state and toward the educated classes. Oh, the educated classes. You know who they were? You know who they were in Yeshua's day? Those were the Pharisees and the scribes. They were the writers. They were the intelligentsia. That's who we face today, the educated class. See, it's the educated class that indirectly reap the benefits. They are the beneficiaries of all of the exploited labor and the wealth extracted, I should say, off of all the exploited labor. The educated class normally benefits from it or they're being educated to learn how to benefit off the blood wealth. But the revolutionary is merciless towards the state and toward the educated classes. He can expect no mercy from them. They're not going to show no mercy on a revolutionary. The educated class in the state had Yeshua, our master, executed. They didn't show no mercy towards him. And he told us they're not going to show no mercy towards us. But is it true? Ought we to be dedicated? For the revolution, that's something else we have lost in the land of the Gentiles, dedication, commitment. We have become a disposable people. The same way that we treat a pair of shoes and any other commodity that we buy in a capitalist society, when it can no longer gratify us, we toss it. When it can no longer bring us any gratification, we get rid of it. And we have taken that mentality with one another. As soon as the movement become uncomfortable, as soon as the movement is asking something from you, you don't think about the overall movement. You think about self-gratification. And you break rank. I'm not saying you who's listening, but you understand what I'm saying in general. So we got to learn to be dedicated. We must learn to be dedicated. The Yeshua was dedicated. Paul was dedicated. He knew he had to go down to Jerusalem and he knew that they're going to try to execute him. But he was going anyway. He's a dedicated man, merciless toward the state. Notice this. We're going to close with five. We're going to close out with number five. Between him and them, between a revolutionary and the supporters of the state, there exist declared or concealed a relentless, irreconcilable, irreconcilable war to the death. He must accustom himself to torture. There is an irreconcilable. It cannot be reconciled what's going on here. And there is a war, whether you know it or not, to the death. And I like to tell people this. I like to tell people this. In the days of Vietnam, learn and learn well. When American soldiers thought they went in there and they thought they occupied a certain territory in Vietnam, 
a little Vietnam, v, you know, a little Vietnamese boy ran up to the American soldier, you know, because they think they took over the land. You understand? They think that they done subdued the Vietnamese. You understand? So a little Vietnamese boy run up there with a little box, and he gonna tell the American soldier, "Shoe shine, sir." You know, people who've been around me, they heard me say this before. Shoe, shoe, shoe shine. Let me shine your shoes. American soldiers sit back because he think he just finished whooping the Vietnamese. You understand? He thought he don't whoop them off into the jungle. So now he's going to sit back and let little Vietnamese boys shine his shoes. Little Vietnamese boys open up that box and blow him up. Blow him up. The Vietnamese boy declared war against the soldier. See, the soldier didn't know that the little Vietnamese boy declared war against him. He thought he was just coming to shine his shoes. He didn't think the little boy come to declare war. So the enemies, if they could, if you don't even know you at war, and one thing you can see is casualties. That is the best kept secret. They have waged war against us. They have tampered with the food supply. And if you're not educated through the grace of God, you don't even know what to eat. They have raged war against us. Irreconcilable too. War to the death. And you got to realize it's a war. See, if that American soldier would have known that the Vietnamese boy had a, had a, 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 a bomb in that box, if he would have known, it wouldn't have happened. But the Vietnamese boy, on the other hand, knew who his enemy was. And the Vietnamese boy know that this American soldier just finished gunning down my uncle. He just finished gunning down my parents, my grandparents. He just destroyed my village. And now he's trying to come in here and take all my resources. And the Vietnamese boy declared war against him. And he obeyed the orders of his daddy. You go up there, son, and I want you to take this box and you're going to die for your people. You're going to die because they have declared war against you, a war to the death. And because the Vietnamese was dedicated, they whooped the tail of the French and they whooped the tail of the Americans and they drove them out of Vietnam. All of the advancements in technology and their technological warfare could not compete against dedicated revolutionaries in Vietnam. The jungles helped the Vietnamese soldiers, where the soldiers of, of America had to declare war on the jungle. So they dropped Agent Orange to kill the trees who are helping the Vietnamese war against these tyrannical pirates. And they declare a war on the jungle. And the beast military is so diabolical that it not only destroyed the trees and sacrificed the trees, they sacrificed their own soldiers unwillingly. See, the little, the little boy, the boy knew what he was doing. But the American soldier wasn't a patriot like that. What they say, drop Agent Orange on us. And the war not over. You know where they put Agent Orange at now? Do you know where they put an Agent Orange now? On your food in a form of pesticides. Do you know what they're doing with all of the war chemicals that they declare war against our brothers and sisters in the second and third world country? They're using that same chemical warfare against us. Kill a bugs in your lawn. Spray this pesticide. Spray it on the food. If we don't understand what the heck going on here, and when I'm talking revolution, I'm talking about, listen, we got to get our food supply together. We got to make, if we don't have farms, which we don't have right now, then we have to join with those locally. We have to build networks because everybody out there is not our enemy. Your local farmer not your enemy. Maybe he can actually teach you to farm. You can see what you're getting. We must understand all aspects of this revolution. People coming together. 
I'm talking about, yeah, let us draw together. Let us set up an account here. You ever hear Susu funds? Set up an account. Take a few dollars from each of us. Put it in per month. So we could start to deal with not selling things to our brothers and sisters, but start to relieve our brothers and sisters and have a fund to draw from. And I'm telling you because these are some of the experience, experiments that we have performed and what we are performing. Now we need others to join in. We need others to join in. Tell me about it. Yada Yahuwah, guerrilla warfare, dominated that technology. Dominated it. Because the people got the power. The people do. Now, so notice this. We're going to end that five. Between him and them, there exists a declared or concealed relentless irrecon irreconcilable war to the death. Now, he got to be dedicated. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 50. He must be dedicated. The revolutionary. He got to be dedicated. Knows what the prophet told us. Isaiah chapter 50. When we get to Isaiah chapter 50, I would like to go to verse 4. The prophet says this, hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me. Excuse me. I'm in 51. That's a good one, too. 50 leads right into 51, but bear with me. We want to go back to 50. Excuse me. Everything I've read still count, though. But now let's apply it to 50 in verse 4. Yehoah Elohim of the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. Now keep that in mind. He hath given him the tongue of a disciple, one who's learned. So he can speak a word so he should know how to speak a word and season to him that is weary. Well, who's weary? Everyone who's being crushed by the oppressor in this filthy social order. The tongue of the learned. See, this, drink, this brings us right back to section three. The revolutionary all day and all night studies the vital science of human beings, their characteristics and circumstances and all the phenomenon of the social order because you must be able to articulate it to those who's being dragged through the ringer or the weary. And it is the almighty who teaches us as we analyze it, study it, meditate on it, pray on it. The Most High fills us up. For what? To speak a word to those who are weary. You see how it's telling us the same thing? First and foremost, got to hit the ground running. We got to go inform our brothers and sisters. No, everybody not going to listen. But enough people will listen to make a change because he got his remnant to listen. His remnant according to the election of grace. It is enough people to make the revolution. We just must, we must find them. And you would know who they are. They're the thirsty ones. They are the ones when they hear his voice, they're going to respond. And But you got to go through a whole lot of rubble to find the valuables. That means we got to hit the ground. Don't get discouraged. Stay dedicated. Notice what he's saying. Dedication. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learn. So does what he's teaching the revolutionary, to teach and to learn, to teach and to learn. He waketh ear up to teach him morning by morning, day and night, he study to learn to teach. Notice this. Five, the Lord hath opened mine ear. I was not rebellious. 
neither turn away back. Notice this. I did not turn away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. This is an example of what Yeshua went through. His dedication. I got up, I talked, but you got to put this together. Could it be that him going out to teach the weary, waking up morning by morning and learning and going out to teach those who are oppressed, the weary, did that lead to giving his back to the smiters? Do you understand like the causation of it? He went out to redeem the weary people, to teach them, to inform them. And in turn, somebody persecuted him, beat his back, gave his cheek to those who plucked off the hair, spit in his face. But through all that, he didn't quit. Notice what he's saying in verse seven. For the Lord God will help me. That's what's on our mind. When it looks like all odds against us, we got to remember the God of heaven will help us. The Lord God will help me. Help you do what? Work towards the revolution. Not to go out here and live good with the capitalists. He has promised to help us as we engage in the revolution. He said, the Lord God will help me. Therefore, shall I not be confounded. Therefore, have I set my face like a flint. I'm moving forward. Full throttle, full speed of head. I have set my face like a flint. And I know, I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near. In other words, all the enemies come forward. Come forward because the one that justifies me, the one he's explaining that will help him, he shall rise. Like the psalmist say, rise, O Yehoah, and let all your enemies be scattered. Crush your enemies. Crush them. And that's what he did in Lisbon and Portugal. Those people who were burning people by the stake. Yehoah sent a, a fire through Lisbon that melted damn near, uh, what they say, uh, burnt up the bone. What they say when you burned up the bone, cremated the inhabitants of the land. He fed them. All of their wealth was destroyed. Their city was destroyed. And thousands of people was destroyed. So the one who's bidding us to the revolution, he got the power. He got the power. Now, I want to read just a couple of more texts before we close out. Dedication. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Dedication. Dedication. Luke chapter 9. We can't give up. We have to take the time out. We have to join with one another. Few people been calling already. Don't get discouraged, people. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Dedication. Revolutionary must be dedicated because he's in a war a war of life and death. And chances are you might not, the spaceships might not come when you think they gonna come. See, they thought the spaceships was coming in 2009 or in, two, in, uh, in the year 2000. It didn't happen. And then you get another teacher cut out the same cloth who said that the bombs was gonna be dropped on America in 2009. So 10 years later, he came with another prophecy. It didn't happen. You see, it didn't happen. 
Some people waiting to flee off into the woods. Some people waiting for that. One common thing, though, is the word wait. They're waiting. They're waiting. And when the Most High come back, he's going to look at his people hungry and he's going to know who's been trying to feed you. He's going to look at his people homeless. He's going to wonder who started an administration going on here which you can get some houses together to cause your people. See, they so quick to want to set up a business to sell something to the people. You know what I'm saying? They want to set up a Hebrew business to sell something, not set up a Hebrew business to create a co-op to sustain the people. Where you have a collective business, where the people are owners of the business. No, no. They want to rent out a house. They don't want to get no houses here where the people are owners. So when the Most High come and he see that you've been selling things to my people, I see that. But where is it of, of my people who couldn't afford it? You know, what, what? where is it that of my people who's thirsty? What, what about my people? And you think those people are just in America? You don't know that the life we live and the benefits we receive is at the expense of others who we don't see. You know, like, you know, the Israelites, I see some of these Israelites walking around, like walking around with the bling bling on. You don't know how you got that gold. You don't know that, uh, that it's children who've been going into the heart of the earth. They don't even go to school. They, they have been conscripted to go into the heart of the earth. Many of them die because of the earth collapsing to extract gold. Do you know all of the bling bling and the, and the luxury and everything that people like to wear so they could shine because they say, you know, we, you know, we wear gold because, you know, we're the descendants of kings. You know, that's blood on that gold. You don't know that, but the creator know. You don't know all the benefits we've been receiving is at the expense of others. But the revolutionary is supposed to know. Those who are of the service of God are supposed to know. Right? It got to go outside your neighborhood, your state. Where is God's people all over the world? They are the ones being exploited in Indonesia. They're the ones being exploited on the countryside in China. They're the ones being exploited in the, in the uh, cashew fields in India. They're the ones being exploited in the blueberry fields and the strawberry fields down here in California. We must learn or else when he makes its appearing, and he is coming to record to to uh make amends for the exploited. I, I pray to God that we not the deceived ones, but we got to be dedicated to get through this. To get through this, and we I know it can be done. I personally, me and my wife personally have been in contact years ago now with a man who set up a dairy farm in, 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 in uh, Tennessee. He's probably passed on now because when we met him, he was like 80-something years old, and that was almost 15 years ago. Through the grace of God, he probably still living. We haven't spoken with him lately, but he spent a lot of time talking with us. So what did they do? They set up a dairy farm in Tennessee. They set up a school, and you know what they did? Because they knew that the mission and the relief of the people had to go beyond America. India. They bought a cow, a bull, a couple of heifers, and some land. And for the people who was coming into the faith, he produced, or they as a group, helped produce the means of production. And now those people could take that bull and that cow and they could breed that bull and cow to make more cattle. How far do the American dollar go? Once we come out of our selfish nature, 
and start to realize what Paul was doing. When he knew the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem needed relief, people in Corinth, pull your resources now. It's not just us. It's a job to be done. A job more than what many of us know because it hasn't been taught in our so-called educational schools, religious schools, Israelite schools, Christian schools, universities. But once the revolutionary studies day and night, human beings and their characteristics and their circumstances and all the phenomena of the present social order, you will start to learn these things. And we're looking for people with like minds. Dedication. I've been saying this over and over again. Let me get you out of here. Luke chapter 9, right? Notice this. Luke chapter 9, and when we get to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, this is what Yeshua is saying. If any man will come after me, follow me. That's what he's saying. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily not every now and again daily and follow me you know what the cross means look it up it means a sacrifice let him sacrifice himself daily for the revolution this go back excuse me, to point one, lose our lives in this social order for the revolution. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Notice this. For whosoever will save his life will lose his life. For my sake, excuse me, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? So lose your life. This is the mode, this is the path to dedication. Oftentimes we're not dedicated because we're worried about ourselves. But we're not done. Skip down a little bit. Verse 57. So he's saying sacrifice yourself. Lose your life in this world. Focus towards the kingdom of God. Focus towards the revolution. Now, down in verse 57. It reads, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. Now, see, that could be that. See, that could fit a whole lot of people. Just imagine yourself there, man. That's noble. He want to go bury his dad. And you're going to hear this young man say, let the dead bury the dead. But thou. Go. But go thou. And preach what? The revolution. The kingdom of God. What is he saying here? Not that you disrespect your parents, but you must focus on the revolution above all else. Verse 61. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. See, they, they, what did the Messiah say? You want to go bid them farewell? You want to go tell them bye? And Yeshua said unto them, or Jesus said unto them, no man, having put his hand to the plow 
and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. You're not even fit for the revolution. At, listen, if you're not dedicated and you're thinking about going back, if, if, if you're not dedicated and something else is distracting you before the revolution, our master himself, who was dedicated to the revolution, said you're not even fit for the kingdom. You're not fit. Now, these are a few things that we read, read through today. Ah, you say what? You sound confounded, my brother. I sound confounded. I'm really not clear on what you mean by I sound confounded. Please listen to and learn from Brother Naquam and Brother Amos in Baltimore, we got next. Let me ask you a question. Uh, if Mr. Lechner 12 is still on, let me ask you a question. Is salvation for all men or just for Israel? If you're still on, if you can answer that question for me, I, I gotta find out if we're talking about the same people. Is the we got next, is salvation for all people or just for Israel? If you hear me or you just posted that and bounced out, obviously I won't get the answer. But if you are listening and you hear me, we could start there. And if you're talking about the same we got next, that same we got next uh, that I've heard of that's cut out the same cloth out of the, out of the root of Abba Bivens and Ariah, then man, I know all about their teachings. And we battled those guys 20 years ago. They were, and not, not necessarily this group, I'm talking about their teachers. And they was wrong then, and they wrong now. That's if it's the same group. But I need a little bit of clarity on who that is, all right? So let's get back to what we wanted to deal with today. The closing out of this revolutionary, all right? Now, it's something I wanna make a detour with as we examine this document. That is the great tribulation. I wanna look into the great tribulation because uh, it plays a part in this revolutionary struggle. We I would like to identify what that is in the upcoming classes, the great tribulation. Because some people teaching Great Tribulation haven't happened yet. You know, the Great Tribulation going to be for three and a half years, all this other stuff. So I want to examine that, all right, as we get uh, more into this document. And um, let's see if we get some clarity on that. And we're going to understand the Great Tribulation, and maybe you could start to fit in what we're saying here as well. So number five, we wanted to remember that the revolutionary is a dedicated man. The revolutionary is dedicated. He's not fit to turn back. He's not, if he turned back, he's not fit for the kingdom. And he is in a irreconcilable war to the death with the present day social order. And I want to close out with two texts to establish that. First, if you will, go back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. And when we get to Daniel chapter 7, I want to establish this. War. We're at war. Daniel chapter 7, one verse. And then we're going to end at Revelation 13. Verse 21, verse 21, I beheld the same horn, the same power. I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now that's the first part. So we know that the power of the social order made war with the saints. Now let's go to Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13. 
When we get to Revelation 13, we're going to read about the beast. Praise the Most High. Thank you, Brother Joseph. God willing, we'll be bringing that up as we take a little detour out these documents. All right. Um, and getting into that. Now, Revelation 13 is speaking of the Roman Empire. The Western civilization today brags on the fact that they are the vestiges or they're founded upon the Greco-Roman Empire. Now, the Greco-Roman Empire made war with the saints then, and they're making war with the saints now. I'm just confirming the fact we got to be dedicated, even though we're under war. Remember what Isaiah said, that servant gave his back to the smiters. Whatever it took, he moved forward. When you started, you don't look back, Yeshua was saying, because you must be determined. And you will move forward until the victory is won. And again, we're just touching the surface in this document. It's more intricate teachings and discussions that must be had. All right. Revelation chapter 13. And I want to start at verse one and two. It reads. And I st stood upon the sand of the sea. And saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a, a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, seat, and great authority. We're talking about a social order of the power of Rome, the social order of the Roman Empire. It was given to them by the dragon. Let's skip down to verse 7. With this power and this authority over the earth, what have they done? Verse 4. And they worship the dragon, which gave power to unto the beast or this empire. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who was able to make war with him? You see how they worship the dragon? And they glorify the military might of the empire? That is that evil, wicked, despicable social order that the revolutionary wants to destroy. They worship the beast. All of the worship of the beast could be found in the public opinions. It could be found in the social morality. That's where you'll find it. All right? Verse 7. And it was given unto him, the empires of Rome, which you will find now in Western Europe. America, Canada, right? And it was given unto him to make war with the saints or the revolutionaries and to overcome them. Other scriptures teach for a season. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So if power was given unto the beast over all kindreds and tongues and nations, then that means their power and influence and their social system shall spread over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And wherever the saints are, under the reign of the beast, there is a war to the death. All right? I, wanted, I want us to think on that one. A war to the death. Now, it's important that we learn how to operate in this war. Very important. Very important. So six and seven is going to talk about the discipline needed of the revolutionary. The discipline he needs to stay dedicated. That's what six is talking about. Seven, when you get into seven, is going to talk about how all kinds of romanticism, all kinds of pride and selfishness and even personal hatred, 
all this individualism must be removed and focus solely on the revolution and the justice of the revolution and all of the personal goals must be set towards the revolution so he's going to close out with six and seven discussing that we're not going to discuss it tonight now I want to take a detour. This is the second week. We're going into this. All right. Now, I want to get into some scriptures. Now, those of you who have the document, if you read through this document and if you have any questions on any of the numbers, well, Brother Judah, well, how does this fit with the scriptures? How did that fit with the scriptures? Bring it up. We discuss it because there's a few here. And some of them here, people may have questions before we get down to it. We can skip around. That's okay. But the purpose of the discussion is to show that the servants of God must be revolutionaries. And I don't mean revolutionaries in theory. I mean revolutionaries in deed. Our agendas is to spread the word. On the agenda, outside of spreading the word, is that our people need food. And when I mean people, I mean the people who's joining onto the God of Abraham. They need food, they need shelter, and they need clothing. That's what they need. And administrations must be put in motion to begin to supply this affordable and have it available to the poor of our people. Many ways we can do it, but it got to get done. Starting off in our little area, certain areas, whatever it might be. On top of that, campaign must go out. Because as you convince others to join into the movement, you are simultaneously striking blows against the beast. Remember I told you that the ruling class security is in the people. What happens when you take the people? What happens when you take enough people? You don't even have to take them all. You just take enough. And that's what God said. He got enough out there. His call. Who's going to take heed to this message? Any feedback? Any feedback from anyone tonight? We've been looking through the revolutionary catechism. Showing that the sentiment of Sergei Nekayev is the same sentiment found in the Bible. What he said and what he wrote for the Europeans in Russia to overthrow the rich, this isn't something that is isolated or just for the secular people. These sentiments, these teachings are found more perfectly in the Holy Scriptures. In the Holy Scriptures. So next time, or as you read in your Bible, realize we talk in revolution. When you talk about Jesus of Nazareth or Yeshua HaMashiach, it's now time to speak of him as a revolutionary. And if we are his followers, then we become revolutionaries. If he went and proclaimed to the ruling class as a witness against them, you got to distribute the wealth. That's what we got to do. You want help doing that? Do you all need help doing that? That's fine. Do you need literature? You need leaflets? You need flyers? You want to participate in the groundwork? God willing, we can help in that area. That's part of the work. That sound like a good that sound that sound good to us, brother Coleman. And that's what we're saying. See, we're not we're bringing some things out to the table tonight, but there's more intimate discussion we need to have 
And we can hold Skype conferences to discuss these matters. Questions, because you should have questions. You should have more in-depth questions on how do we do this. That's why we got our number up here. Okay. What I'll do, I'll I'll post. I didn't do it. I need to do it before I start these these posts. But brother, if you look in the link below, go to the link of this class and uh our number will be there. Now, are you able to call us or do you specifically need the email? I, 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 again, I hope I'm pronouncing. I'm, I'm gonna pronounce your last name. I hope I'm saying it right. Mizemila, Mizemila. Okay. In fact, number. Email. Ms. Emila. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Number E, that's for anybody. I know my email get filled up kind of quick. And I got to go out and clean it out every couple of days. But if it bounces back, try another day. You can email it or 716-885-2289. Someone will reach you. You dialogue. And from there... Um, if you want to continue the dialogue, I normally just go ahead and um get a person my um uh personal number where they well that's actually a number we could reach where I dwell. But the personal number you where they say a cell phone every now and again. But I like to give people this number because God willing you can uh, reach us there. No doubt, because sometimes uh I might not want to be bothered with the cell phone. Shalom blessed. Shalom to you. Shalom to you. How you doing on the Sabbath? Hopefully everything is well with you. Now we went through a few, quite a few things this evening. Sound good. Sound good. And again, it's just touching the surface. Just bringing things to our awareness. One of the purposes I'm doing is is because people got to realize if you are a Bible believer, you are a revolutionary. What kind of a revolutionary? Not in theory, but in deed. So I want to go through, I, I, my intent is to go through this writing of the revolutionary catechism because this is what real revolutionaries did pre-USSR. They followed these sentiments and they made a change. Gandhi followed the revolutionary teachings and he made a change. I'm saying this because Yah has given us examples that if people just use parts of what he's saying, you see results. Now, just imagine if we go full throttle with the, everything. Full throttle with everything. Bear with me a second. Every now and again, I got to get them something situated real quick. Hold on. And if you have any other question, anything you want to know from us, just post it if you can so we can address it.
All right, thank you. Forgive me about that. It's going to be revolutionary. What's yes, the revolutionary catechism by Sergi Nekayev. Yes. Um, were you able to get your hands on that document? Shalom, sister. You up late. It's always a pleasure. That's one of the soldiers right here just popped in. Yahweh has spoken. Shalom to you. Shalom to you. That's one of our soldiers there. Good morning. All right. Okay. It's morning time. Early. Gotcha. Gotcha. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Got the Netherlands up here. Oh, okay. Yes, it is morning time. Yes, ma'am. Hope everything going well over there with you and the family. Yeah, yeah, we up. We trying to get things going around here. Share some, uh, share some information to show that the Bible. You know what? It, you know what it's about. About this Bible being a revolutionary. Uh, it is the revolutionary catechism. And um, brother Joseph, as you read through it again. And I don't know, um, I don't know, sister, if you have the uh, document. I don't know if you've seen the other class. Uh, Yahweh has spoken. Have you seen a document that we were uh, comparing uh, by Sergi Nekayev? Um, but you could find it on uh, the, let me see if I could put it down right this time. I think I got it right this time. I hope. You can find a document on there. But again, we're going through that to show that what got this man put in jail at 35. Well, he died at 35 years old. Sergi died at 35. He died in prison because of complications. They pretty much starved him out more than likely. And, you know, wasn't giving him any nutrition, uh, any wholesome foods. And uh, but he was an enemy to the state. And when we start to adopt these, we, we're going to become enemies to the state, enemies to the state. And the glorious thing about the kingdom of God is that, like I made reference earlier, uh, I had a question because uh, some people say that, you know, they, they came in and they left a little comment to put a plug in for the uh, Israel, so-called Israelite groups. He called We Got Next. And I asked one question because I had some questions to follow up behind that about salvation. Is it just for Israel? Um, but anyhow, what I'm saying about that is that that's one thing that makes this movement even stronger, is that we're going back to the roots of Adam. We're going right back to early society. And we're going back to the sons and daughters of Adam or the sons and daughters of Noah. And that increases the strength. And it's what Paul was talking about in the book of Galatians. For people to run out and teach damnable uh, doctrines about the people of other nations or the ethnic group from other nations, that is simply, it, it undermines your whole idea. In fact, it undermines the promise made with Abraham because Abraham, in Abraham shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Two is, those who could be assets to the movement, you're undermining. You're undermining the whole movement by just teaching this thing of just Israel, pretty much religious Israel, and it, and excluding all other social groups. So it's only a matter of time before witness is shown that that's going to come of nothing. Okay, and even the founders, Abba Bivens, and these other guys who founded this sect of so-called Israelites who teach this hate doctrine, Yeshua told you that you could tell a, co a corrupt tree by the fruit it bears, okay? And look at the fruit. 
They argue and fighting. They treat the women like trash. They, you know, th you know, they fighting against one another. You got all of these different groups that broke out from one west. They all fighting one another. They like a bunch of gangs, even to the point they shooting at each other. They exploiting one another. They robbing the people. People leaving and breaking rank because the women being abused. They leaving and breaking rank because they're making merchandise out of them, selling them all this other stuff people can't afford. So when you look at the fruits, they told the world that the white man will be enslaved by the year 2000. I had a clip of that, the guy Jermaine Grant, who called himself Tazadakia, who got raided by the FBI. And I heard now he done pled guilty. Years ago, we knew he was a crook. You understand what I'm saying? But the people had to learn for themselves. But his teachers were crooks. And the rest of them, they all cut out the same cloth. And you see the fruits. So the year 2000 came and gone. 20 years ago, it didn't happen. Then you get another one rising up. You know. He told everybody to flee to Babylon. Yeah, I, I keep talking about them because they're not just going to sweep it under the rug. I know they wanted to sweep it under the rug. No, the Torah said, mark them and know that y'all haven't spoken by them. And you think that they're going to give all of these false prophecies and you still think they're the servants of the Almighty. The creator done showed you he's not speaking by them. And so... This guy want to sit up here and tell us who to look. You know, we need to check out. We got next. If it's the same one. Now, if it's not the same ones, I'm not talking about you. But if it's the same guys cut, cut out of one West, the same guys who teaching these damnable hearsays, don't get baptized. Right. Same ones. So you teaching with water. They got all these damnable hearsays. Nothing good. Nothing good going to come out of it. And I'm just telling other people stay out the way. Because when y'all bring judgment down on these men who's blaspheming his name, saying that they Israelites, undermining the promise he made to Abraham about the blessings of the nations. Oh, I'm telling you, you just better move out the way. Just move out the way. It's nothing going to come of it. That's it. Nothing going to come of it. Period. When they start to teach a doctrine of equity and justice, and peace for all men. When they start to realize that the wicked are the it isn't the white man, the wicked is the oppressors of the world. You know, they go to Job. What is that? Earth been given to the hands of the wicked, right? They go to the book of Job, say the earth been given to the hands of the wicked. And if not, who and uh, and, and where is he? I asked them a question. When Job said the earth was given into the hands of the wicked. When he said that, who was ruling the world at that time? Now you see, don't let them continue to trick you the way that they teach the Bible. These guys who call themselves Israelites, I'm gonna go out on a limb, them guys out of one west and all of the, 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 the groups that came out of them, them, them dudes don't know the Bible. They do not know the Bible. That's why when it comes down to the 12 chart, chart, chart and all this other stuff, that listen to their teachings. It's ridiculous. It do not come out the Bible. They claim they come out the Bible, but they give their interpretation. I'm going to tell you something. They read in Revelation chapter, read in the book of Revelation about the great red dragon come out to earth. They said the great red dragon is the white man. Okay, so now they got to justify that the white man is Cain. So I said, well, how did Cain get across the flood? Then they throw something else at you. Reincarnation. Wait a minute. Wait, just, just, just wait. Wait, look, these guys don't know the Bible. They, 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 they don't, they could read the Bible and say you don't need to be baptized. They go into the Bible. Now everybody Israelite. They say Ruth is Israelite. They say Cornelius is an Israelite. They read partial scriptures. Paul told you that the Israelites were sent to the nations. Why? Because Abraham's children, they are to be a blessing to the nations. So you can follow these dudes if you want to. You understand? Go do whatever you got to do. Don't, don't bother me. Don't bother me.
because I know whoever the almighty is, his people, they're going to hear his voice. These guys have some heck of a way to interpret the scriptures. I mean that. So who was ruling when Job said the earth is given to the hands of the wicked? Who's in the, who was ruling? If you people online don't know who was ruling, I'll tell you. The Babylonians. Well, Brother Judah, well, how do you know? Because if you read Job chapter one, who came and took Job's flocks? Babylonians. Now, there's a debate on which Babylon it was. Was it Neo-Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar and the Assyrians? They wasn't white people. And some try to uh, put Job all the way back before Abraham. So therefore, if it's talking about those Babylonians, they were the Ethiopians. So the empire that came and robbed Job, Job said the earth has been given to the hands of the wicked. They covered the faces of the judges. Who was ruling the world when Job said it? Colored folks. But because these guys don't read the Bible, they don't know that. Or they just refuse to accept that. It's good you haven't heard from him in a long time because of the, you know, it, 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 you know, it's good that you haven't heard the garbage. But I'm here to tell you that the Most High going to take out the garbage. Just like he took out the garbage in 70 AD. All of those Israelites who were zealots, the Most High took out the garbage. He told his people how to find safety and all of the other zealots, fifth philosophy, Sakari, and the rest of them, all who were a part of the hostility, right? Titus dealt with them. You got in one sense, I hear these Israelites talking about God going to come. They can't wait to get spiritual power. And they run around, they're going to cut your head off. And then there's another one arguing that the government try to take your guns. Have you never read what Paul said that our weapons of war isn't carnal? I ain't worried about no damn gun or sword. We don't need none of that. But they need it because they're off. They need it. And they're mad because they just want to take the place of their oppressor. If you got a, if you're part of an Israelite class, that their doctrine is none other than a mirror image of them being the oppressors, then you know you're in the wrong place because God, Yah, is going to destroy all oppressors. And I already know what they're going to read. Isaiah, they're going to bring all the wealth to Israel. Yeah, I know, but do you know they, what Israel is going to do with that wealth? Brothers and sisters, those of you who've been listening, you know, you know, look, every man got a right to go where he's going to go. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying everybody out there wrong. I'm simply saying the doctrine that I've presented to you is wrong. The, the, the doctrine that I've presented to you that these guys are teaching is wrong. They come right off the bat telling you you don't have to be baptized with water. When Yeshua himself was baptized with water, they come out the gate messed up. And if you want to follow him, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Cat talking about we got next. Yeah. Who are the we? Just Israel? And if you saying it's just Israel who got next, you all messed up. You know, people, uh, forgive me. You know, if people go along and they, they come with the doctrine, look, uh, everybody else, you know, they got their own land. Except us. That's not really true. It's, it's false in so many aspects. Our fathers, some of them are still in Palestine. Some of them are still in the land of Egypt, Yemen, Libya. From the Sahara, they penetrated into Africa. I mean, they're still there under different names. And God willing, we're going to present a teaching on Israel, like Israel and where they're at. God willing, we want to try to present something to you. We're going to follow the Israelite colonies in, when, they fled, when they went into China, India, Africa. 
Europe. Okay. We won't spend much time on Europe, but we know that they went there because the 10 tribes was brought up into that territory. But I want to bring out a lot of Israelite settlements in India, and India was the gateway to China and Africa. All right. And we know through the scatter, we're going to briefly look at the scatter and how they were scattered up into Europe, Portugal, and, and Spain. But we still have ancestors in Palestine and even uh, the Middle East. Number one. Number two is this. Just because you're in the land, that's why I'm making that point. Just because they're in the land of Palestine don't mean that they possess the land of Palestine. So just because you see some China, Chinese people still in China, they still don't possess the land of China. You say, brother, brother Judah, that's a what you talking about? That's a contradiction. No. Who possesses the land in China? Not all Chinese, just only the rich Chinese. Okay, the sons of Ham. Who possesses the land in, in uh Africa? Let's say Kenya, Mozambique. Okay, wherever you want to go, Senegal. Who possessed the land? The ruling class. They possess it. Most of the people, whether you are in China, whether you are in Africa or in Europe, even in Europe, it's the rich who possess the land. Most of the people have been dispossessed of their territory. This is the unknown truth. Not just the black people here have been colonized all over the world. People in China working land in China that don't even belong to them no more. It belongs to the corporation. Yes, in China, known as the Communist Party, but we know they're not communists. And that's the truth. In fact, China is infiltrating Africa, getting the land, building in Africa, robbing it of resources. Who? The rich Chinese. It's a mess over the globe. And that's why when we read section three in the Revolutionary Catechism, day and night, the revolutionary must study the vital science of human beings. You got to study the science of human beings, their characteristics and their circumstances. That's the only way you can bring forth just judgment to get a clear picture of the revolution. Okay? So, my brothers and sisters, um I don't know who's still on with us tonight. Uh, but I appreciate you. And we're going to take a little break out of the catechism. But if anybody have read through the catechism, um, because there's so much here, and I'm telling you, each one can be established by the scriptures. Each one, not as you get further down the methods, the methods change where, um, Sergi brings to the table, but the goals are the same. Now, the more perfect way is, is that we got to, we don't need a gun. You know what I'm saying? We don't necessarily have to do that. In fact, Paul said, don't, we don't need it. We got a greater power. And that's why I read to you the account of Lisbon and Portugal. To show you that power. And you can see it today. Look around the globe. And I pray the Almighty have mercy on us. You know, I don't know what could happen here. I know he sent a snowstorm in Buffalo that shut everything down. Everything. You know how they make them trucks where they think they trust to get through the rough terrain. No, the creator shut stuff down in Buffalo in a moment's notice. 
and he pick and choose the areas too in a moment's notice. Hallelujah. Praise the Almighty. Shalom to you, Sister Pat. Y'all still up? Praise the Most High. Praise the Most High. Thank you all for that. Thank you all for that. But again, if you have questions that you read through it, that's one thing, God willing, we'll get through it, touch on little by little. But I definitely want to get back. I want to discuss this great tribulation thing. All right. I want to discuss that and, and look into that. And then hopefully um, it might not be on live, but we definitely, God willing, be able to put out a teaching on the lost tribes of Israel. And um, there we want to have, because here we can't post, I, you know, I like to have pictures and maps and, and references at the bottom. So God willing, he allow us to do that project. Um, that will be done, uh, pre-recorded and posted. Okay. But that's the project we're working on and hopefully we can get something out to you soon with that. And one of the reasons in doing that project is to show that Israel literally have been planted in every nation under the sun. And if they take their rightful role, we are all in position to fulfill the will of God. If we allow him to use us to agitate, if he allows us or use us, we allow him to use us as his instruments, then, you know, it's an honor and it is surely going to lead us to the revolution. The name of the book, glory be to the almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes, sir, brother Joseph. All right, shalom and blessing. Uh, Brother Coleman, it's not a book. It's actually a, a, if you scroll down or if you type in revolutionary catechism, in fact, uh, it's a revolutionary catechism. You can find it online at www.marxist.com dot org revolutionary catechism in fact if you type in revolutionary catechism um on a google search search engine they're going to give you a few selections and brother coleman when you see it click on the link of the revolutionary catechism that is produced by marxist.org marxist.org and there you can download that documentation for free and again when you read down further some of us might wonder like wait well, hey, you know how this time with the bible it god willing you know we'll be able to show you and if there's any of them that really sticks out to you if you read ahead you could present it as a question and we can we can go into the scriptures on it. So um, it's a very interesting documentation, and it can be supported by the Bible. But the Bible, like I say over and over again, it has the more perfect way of doing it. All right, the more perfect way. So God willing, keep us in prayer, and we have some more teachings to bring to you, and um, some more information to bring to you. Stay in prayer. And again, the most I put on your heart, move you to reach out. Don't hesitate. God willing, we'll be looking forward to that. And um, don't forget to sign up. I'll, God willing, post that link on, uh, because for some reason it's not posting on our chat. But after the class is done, if you go back, post the link to sign up to our um, our mailing list where you can keep abreast of the different articles that we posting out is all a part of our education, our education and agitation uh, program. That's what the, we got to agitate. I had an elder around here all the time years ago. You got to agitate them. All right. Okay. We got next is a collection of different camps. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, that's what I figured is that same, um, 
One West group, because I have seen them on YouTube. I believe they were the ones who went down to uh, Washington. And they went down to the, to, to uh, Washington, D.C. to let the government know that they Israelites. I think that's the same group. Um, but, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, the, the bot, yes, yeah, those guys, yeah. Yeah, so I figured it was them. And, um, yeah, those are, okay, I mean, every man, every man, listen, time will tell. So if they're of the works of God, then they're going to, you, you you know, they're going to take you the right way. But if they're not, then it could be trouble. And the only way you can learn whether they're of the works of God or not is to really study the scriptures, to really study it. And um, that's how you will find out. And if they're not talking about justice for all men, all men, then right off the bat, they take you down the wrong way. Right off the bat, they take you down the wrong way. Now, so we're going to get ready to close for this evening. I thank everybody for taking the time out. And uh, again, God willing, we'll be presenting another discussion and a teaching next week to you. Um, but if something happened or go on before then that we feel that we want to bring something, I always keep a post out now because we might pop up on you during the week. But uh, we like to try to get our stuff together to present some stuff to you. And um, until next time, God willing, we'll be here at the same time. And I pray that we all can meet again uh, and that the most I have mercy on us. Yes, yes. Check it out from the beginning. Um, thank you, sister. Thank you for hanging out with us again. And uh, Shabbat Shalom to you and your house. Um, yes, 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 sister. Yahweh has spoken. God willing, we'll see you tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead and try to give me some rest. All right, all right. Eps down on Eps sur surface on the scene. Peace and blessings to your uh was to your sister Alicia. Again, thank you all for hanging out with us. Oh, BA was on the scene tonight too. All right, brother BA. Yes, we got the soldiers on the scene, and um, I know you up now. So when we start class a little later, it's gonna be almost your bedtime. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get started on time thank you we appreciate that thank you thank you thank you z for that um thank you so much bless for taking the time out to hear us out peace and blessings upon you and your house and we say peace and blessings for all of you who sincerely search in the word of the Almighty. And uh, again, make use of the number. And I also would like to say, if any of you have questions of different um, subjects and topics that possibly we can help out in, I mean, we won't know until we see the topic or the subject that you might want to deal with. Um, feel free to call us about that and even leave a message. And if you want to email me personally that you might have questions on, because I know sometimes our people will leave comments on our YouTube about certain lessons and teachings, wondering if we have them. And um, I always don't get around to it when I'm editing. But I figure if we're doing things live, it's a little easier. It's just already being recorded. Maybe we can address and deal with some lessons and teachings on you all who's listening. Questions that you may have um, pertaining things we're teaching about. 
or other things that you have heard. So, you know, um, we want to be a service in that area as well. And you pass, you could send some of your questions. to this email take that email down my god my everything shalom to you um you say that would be me and what are you making reference to uh questions and this is to my god my everything are you talking about that would be you who possibly will have questions for us? Yes, okay. Take down that email. That's uh that's my email there. And uh again, this is our number. Oh, hold on. Um, no, you, you can write your questions in the in a comment. Hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on, hold on. One minute. Okay, you can write your questions in the comment. You can call, but if you have questions. And let's say you have a topic or something or some questions in it. it uh, Sometimes to answer questions, it's, it's good to get in depth. Or, you know, so if you have questions, you could call or send a question by email. Hopefully I can get that so it can be addressed. Because I, it's something I'm glad. I want to apologize, too, because I don't know how the time thing works. Meaning there's like a time lapse from when I'm saying something. So in other words, I might not see it. It might pop up later. So I might look at it. You, you don't ask your question and I go back to, and I, and I get off of the, uh, the comment board and sometimes I will lose it. And I've noticed that a few times people have asked questions and it wasn't that I was ignoring you. It was actually, I didn't see it until later. Sometimes I didn't see the question until I reviewed a video. So I definitely, you know, I don't want people to feel uh, slighted by that because I don't do that on purpose. I didn't do that on purpose, but I might not see the question. So with emails, phone number, if you have questions, then one of us can address it or we can deal with some of the topics um, on, a, on, a, on a, a Google Live class. And you ask the false prophet, which false prophet are you making reference to in Revelation chapter 13? BA, that's who you're making reference to? I think. Okay, good. I know I, I've seen that done. Um when uh even last week um i think a sister had posted a question and i i didn't see it when i was posting a link one sister was saying she didn't get the link and i didn't know that she didn't get it and then an hour or so later another sister posted it that she didn't get the link and i seen her question so um i don't like doing that i like to uh address it and again, but there's the email and the phone number. Okay, yeah, we'll talk tomorrow. Yeah, that Thessalonians. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that is a good one. That is a good one. And um, we have been having in-house discussions on that. And maybe we will get around to that one. Maybe we will get around to that one. But, you know, um, we've been putting little plugs in about it every now and again. But most high willing, true indeed. We'll talk about it, God willing, tomorrow. Most high willing. So, 
please take the phone number down. Take the email address down if you have questions. I'll keep an eye out for that. And sign up for our email list. Um, so therefore, you get newsletters that's being put out, informational pamphlets. And, and, and if you decide that you want to start putting some work in as far as getting the word out, we are willing to supply PDFs so people can make copy of flyers. If it is difficult for you to make copies, we could work something out where we can send you copies of flyers and leaflets. But that's when you're ready for that stage of things when you feel that you want to do it. Or those of you online who want to see or view some of our flyers and free. We have free flyers and leaflets that we can mail to you if you want to get some of our literature. But you got to let us know you want it. And then we can mail it right out to you, okay? And then some people, uh, we can actually uh, email PDFs to you so you can read it over. So it's up to you. We try to make things available for the education of the saints or the revolutionaries, okay? So take us up on the offer and um, the door is open for you, all right? If you, I'm going to post, Brother Joseph, I'm going to post it where you sign up at. It's a link. I didn't post it for this class. However, if you go to last week's class and you click the, um, if you click the link below, you will have to go to the uh, last week's class and then you go to the little, you go to the, um, bear with me a moment. What do you call that? You go to the little, um, I guess they call it inbox. You click the arrow next to the title. You had a description box. You go click the arrow. Once you click that arrow, it's going to open up a link and uh, it'll let you know the email signing list. It's going to have our phone number, our Facebook uh, web address, and our, um, yeah, basically our web address, our Facebook address, phone number, and it's going to be a link you could click on to sign up for the emails. So as the brothers or as the sisters, because they on a on a move with that, as they dish out this information, you will get it. And, and as far as I understand, it's coming weekly. Um, so sign up for that. Okay, sign up for that. All right. But I will be posting, God willing, soon as this video come up where I can edit it. I'll be posting a link on this class too. But if you want it right away, go back to last week and you can uh, get the link there. All righty. Shabbat shalom to you all. And again, thanks for the love you all been sending and the thumbs up. And, uh, I, you know, I'm sure we'll be getting some thumbs down. But for all of those who gave us the thumbs up, we appreciate you. And may the most high bless your understanding. All of you who sincerely searching. And um, all right. So shalom and blessings to you again. And let's pray that we could meet up again. God willing, Elohim willing, next week. All right? So shalom and blessings to you.